G'day, legends. It is Anthony, AOS coach here, bringing you Faction Focus, STD. No, I don't have to go to a clinic. We are talking about the Slaves to Darkness, uh, one of the OG factions that doesn't get enough love, and I am excited here to talk with two Australian STD legends. The first one I have is one of my local lads, uh, Sean. G'day, Sean. How are we? How are we? Oh, my gosh. Actually, stand up and show show the internet this amazing shirt that uh, back at CanCon, uh, Rob Symes and you had this awesome photo. So talk talk to the viewers so they can see it. I can't see the back. Oh, look, that was back in the time when, uh, you know, Rob was really kicking things off. And at that point, they've changed quite a bit since then. But he, he had his little call sign about, you know, any army could be a winning army. And I think it, that really hit a few notes with a few slaves to darkness players more so than anyone else. Uh, and, and I felt noting that Rob was going to go down there and that I was committed to playing slave for darkness, uh, that, that it was worth representing properly, you know, putting my true colors out there and obviously referencing back to, to the call sign that uh, the honest war gamer had put out there. So I, I thought I'd represent when I went down there. So that's, the and, and, and what is that, that slogan? Uh, any army could be a winning army. Now, I'll, I'll cut it short then because I think he was being uh, chopping and changing about uh, how he wanted to pronounce it every week that he had his uh, podcast up. Um, it was a little differently. So I thought, look, just for consistency, let's put uh, a bit of an Aussie flavor to it. So I decided that I put down that any army could be a winning army if you stop being a pork chop about it. So uh, I think that ran home with a few Aussies. I think it confused Rob a little bit talking to, to Dan after, but I think he... Uh, yeah, he got the gist of it after a bit, and I think he was a bit humoured by it too. So that was good. That was the intention. But pork shop, pork chop, not meaning like a literal pork shop that you're going to put applesauce on. Uh, that's uh, what, what do we mean by pork chop for our international viewers who are already like, what on earth are we talking about? Yeah, yeah. Oof. I don't know, Trav. What would you? You've heard that before. What would you? Uh, be yeah, being a pork chop, you're carrying on a bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. Been a bit silly. Yeah, been a bit silly about it. Yep. All right, so yeah, so basically, uh, there's nothing silly about slaves to darkness. We are here, uh, and and you had a really good uh, analogy that I'm sure we'll we'll understand a little bit more, and you'll share uh, later in the show. But Sean, you're a local player. You've been playing for a long time. I think CanCon a few few years. You've played slaves. Is that correct? Yeah, last year was pure slaves. Uh, the year before, I did Mark of Zench. Um, did quite well that year as well which I was happy with. Um, so, uh, but beyond that, it's been slaves or um, uh, marked slaves pretty much for the last couple of years. And uh, one, one thing I love about your Slaves to Darkness army is that um, there's a very OG flavor to it. So you've got some old uh, metal the Marauders or Chaos Warriors that you've got some very, very old models in there mixed with some new models. And it's like a yep. nice little like nod to the Undivided Gods. Yeah, I had a lot of older models from when I first started playing back in the 1980s. Uh, they weren't Marauders, they were thugs uh, for, for the old school players out there. And uh, when it came time to running some Marauders in the army, I was looking at what's out there at the moment, you know, the cast of 300. And I thought, you know what, the old 80s models have a lot more flavor to them. So I thought I, I'd use them and um, I'm happy running those at the moment. They're a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, it's good to have you here, and I know you're going to add a lot of experience. Uh, a man who probably needs no introduction, one of the Heralds below. Not even the Heralds Below. What? I was, you know, I was, I'm mixing what? that up. Far out. Yeah, they, the Dwellers Below wish you were a Dweller, but you are a Herald of War. Uh, I was going to talk about CanCon and the man who's adding so many tables and terrain, and uh, I was getting mixed up with the amazingness that was Travis Cooper. Um, Travis, oh. hello. And you're also an amazing painter. Um, no, I do all right. You do, you're such a humble man. You oh. are a very humble person. But uh, for people who don't know who you are and they're not listening to Heralds of War because uh, they're crazy, who are you? Um, yeah, so my, my name's Travis. Um, as as, uh, as uh, Anthony said, one of the, um, the Heralds of War these days with um, Clint and Adam. Um, been in the hobby, I've well, been in the hobby itself for 20 odd years. Um, been in Age of Sigma since just after it started. Um, and, uh, yeah, most recently I've been kicking around a, um, a Slaves to Darkness army, which admittedly is more of a um, hobby army than an actual, uh, than a gaming sort of focus thing. Um, I didn't much care about what it actually did on the table when I actually put it all together, um, but then I've tried to make it work from there. So, um, yeah, I've been, been kicking around a, a Slaves to Darkness army for a while now and having a bit of fun with it, but um, it's actually it's, it's on its way to retirement, but... Um, 
we, 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 I've learned a lot along the way after the, uh, I think, four events I've taken it to. Um, so, yeah, cool to talk about it for a bit. Yeah, and maybe, maybe it's like a knowledge retention. We're going to kind of document all the great stuff you guys have done and you can look back at this and who knows, there's big rumours that there's going to be a Chaos Undivided Battle Tome or maybe there's going to be like a blend of this and uh, the Ever Chosen and, the, you know, the expansion of Warcry. Who knows what that's going to do to uh, the unmarked Chaos faction. But in the meantime, uh, we have, a, we have uh, Allegiance abilities in uh, the General's Handbook. So it is a good time to talk Slaves to Darkness. So, uh, Sean, Travis, you both kind of talked about your experience. You played them for a little bit of time, some longer than others. I guess what interested you guys the most when it came to playing with Slaves to Darkness? Like, why did you pick this up as opposed to going with newer models or maybe like a sexier battle tome like Blades of Corn? Uh, Sean, I'll throw it over to you. Why did you pick up Slaves to Darkness? Yeah, no worries. Uh, well, it's... Something I didn't, coming into AOS, I didn't actually sit down and look at all the different armies and decide, look, they were the ones to go with. A um, bit of history on myself. I played a lot when I was younger, uh, back in primary school. Same old story that you hear a lot in terms of getting out of it during high school and so forth. But, um, you know, when I got back into it, well, two, three, bit of, and a four years ago, um, I never got rid of my models. Um, and back when I was playing a lot younger, again, like I said, I had the thugs from... Uh, from the 1980s, and I did have a lot of the older um, Chaos uh, Undivided models then. So I thought, look, I'd strip them down, repaint them, see how they'd go. Um, and then obviously at that time they still weren't that great on the tabletop, but look, I wasn't after uh, a podium by any means. So it was really good getting out there and learning how to play. And then I thought, you know, I actually don't mind playing with these. Um, you can still have a lot of fun with them. Uh, reading some of the lore that's come out uh, through AOS um, in some of the uh, the audio novels that I've had to listen to, uh, they're a lot of fun. I enjoy how they operate on the on the on the tabletop. Um, I have dabbled in some of the others, uh, Night Horde, Corn, and a few others, and I don't mind them. They're different, but I don't know. I just get um, a certain um, uh, level of enjoyment out of uh, pushing these particular models around um, on the on the on the tabletop. And Travis, yourself, what drew you? And obviously, uh, for anyone who doesn't know Travis and has seen his Twitter, he's got an untraditional um, Slaves to Darkness army where, actually, I'll let you you share a bit more about your your story and what what, what people can expect. Pardon me. Um, yeah, so as, yeah, uh, as I sort of said before and as was alluded to, so mine was um, more of an attempt at a hobby. Uh, focus than, than actually putting together a, a serious competitive army. Um, so I guess the reason I chose it was um, because I had a story in mind and I wanted to uh, sort of, I wanted to portray that story. Now I could have done it differently. I could have built the whole army slightly differently and came up with the reason why um, my, so it's based on a, a sort of a fallen stormcast chamber um, uh, why why that Stormcast, why, why those Liberators became, you know, Blood Warriors instead of Chaos Warriors or something like that. I'm sure I could have worked all that in, um, but I didn't really want to head down that route in the end. Um, I, I wanted to do more of a generic -y kind of um, Chaos Army. As it ends up turning, as it and as it ended up, I, um, I ended up marking most of it anyway. So um, I sort of played Slaves to Darkness, corn without using any of the corn stuff so it was a bit of a funny kind of um combination and certainly not the best combination on the tabletop but that's not what i was sort of super concerned with actually having at the end of the day so um yeah so it's basically a an army uh, in terms of what it represents as the slaves to darkness part of the army it represents a lot of the traditional slaves to darkness units so it's got marauders warriors knights chosen stuff like that so um it's sort of a, a good mix of the generic parts of chaos pretty much everything except for chariots is represented in there so um yeah that, that's that's kind of the direction i went with it was a little bit different but, uh, yeah, yeah look 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 uh, uh you know when you come into slaves to darkness they are an army uh with some beautiful models um but when you come into it it's definitely not that uh pick up a battle tome and you know daughters of cain slanesh slaves to dark uh, you know th these armies are uh, are good and they tell, they tell a great story but certainly they are not winning top of the table and it takes tactic, but also gives you a lot of creativity and a, a lot of ways to 
bring an idea to the forefront, which is why I like the Slaves to Darkness faction and why we're going to talk about why these guys are great as opposed to, you know, just putting them into um, another allegiance. So might throw it off. What are the strengths uh, to this army? Maybe Sean again, what's the strengths of the Slaves to Darkness faction? Yeah, well, look, I've got a few pages here. Um, He's been doing his homework, which is good. They're all blank. Um, so unfortunately for that question, uh, look, they're, they're fun. Uh, they're enjoyable uh, and they're a challenge is probably the, the key strengths of it. Um, uh, a lot of the other battle tomes, you, you'll see that they've obviously from a horde point of view or from a, a monster match point of view, uh, they have key ways, synergies, so forth, that, that are really good. Um, I think when you look at all those key areas, Slaves doesn't stand out in, in any of those traditionally, and I think that's why they are at the moment and, and why you don't see a lot of people playing them. So it, it really has to come down to a sense of enjoyment, your expectations of it, and, and the gameplay. So it's sort of like a... Um, it's a it's a quiet taste really in it, and um, if you just feel as though you just you, you like pushing these type of models around and you can make them work for you, then that's really the strength in it. Um, there's nothing specific that you know I'd give you uh, if you know, we're having a different type of um, uh, battle time or army focus. Yeah, yeah. And, and and Travis, have you found any limitations or you know big challenges that you face uh, as a weakness that? Uh, should be considered or before I go by and, and think that this army is amazing at long range shooting surprise. It's not uh, like, what are the weaknesses? So you pretty much don't have shooting. Um, so I think there is one shooting attack on the, one of the monsters, I think from memory, but um, um, so you pretty much don't have shooting. So you don't have a way to deal with people at range unless it's through magic. Um, you don't have summoning. You, you can have teleporting. So there's a forge world character, sail of faithless that you can have, in your army, um, who is a slave to darkness character, um, so he doesn't have to be an ally or anything like that. Um, but he's quite expensive, um, so you can get a teleport out of the army. But um, for two hundred points, I think it is because you have to buy him and his little pet spawn that goes with him. Probably not a great investment of points. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, so you don't have any of that sort of cool stuff. Um, there is a couple of things in there though um, that I've found through playing um, the old. Good old Chaos Warrior with a sword and shield um, can be surprisingly resilient because um, basically any Chaos shield in your army, so any model that's holding a shield, has um, essentially a five up ward save against mortal wounds or five up mortal wound save. Um, so you can, I, I have surprised myself and other people with how how much it can actually take to chop your way through 10 Chaos Warriors. Um, they, they can sometimes stick around longer than people suspect they might. Um, two wounds a piece and a four up save. So they're the same as a liberator, but they've got a mortal wound save as well. So um, they, they can be su uh, surprisingly resilient. Um, I think the, the war shrine is a, a underestimated piece, even though it itself in terms of its fighting ability and stuff like that's a little bit average. Um, what it does for your army, the buffs can give and the, the sort of, the, again, it has a, a sort of a death save bubble that, that hangs around it. Um, can, can up your resilience and stuff as well. So I think there's definitely a few things in there, but um, you certainly do have a lot of um, uh, weaknesses to play around as well. Um, yeah. Sean, any other weaknesses you'd want to call out? And obviously we just talked about some of the awesome strengths as well. Um, anything else to consider or any weaknesses of the faction? Oh, look, I, I just want to reinforce Travis's point about that mortal wound save. I think um, all pe you know, people know that they generally come with the rune shield and there are a lot of uh, units in there that can, can utilise that five-up mortal wound save. It, it definitely is underestimated. And I remember a game from CanCom where I just had everything bunched up and, and had one of the uh, Stormcast comments dumped straight in the middle and a big grin to say, that's it, it's going to obliterate everything. So to, to, with the War Shrine... Um, uh, a uh, allied in Harbinger and, and a few mysticals at that point um, between the whole army that pretty much got hit by that mortal wound explosion. I lost about three chaos warriors um, out of the whole thing and maybe three wounds on the Lord of Manticore. So people are very surprised about how resilient they are. Um, but again, the weaknesses, movements, uh, like Travis said, the shooting, uh, the itself it's mortal wound output and it's general rend output is, is very weak across the board so you've got to be very tricksy with them to to be successful yeah look and, and you know I, I probably want to acknowledge that today is the day uh when we're recording that um that war cry comes out 
And uh, from my understanding, uh, the Warcry units are going to have uh, Slaves to Darkness keyword. Uh, so should you be watching this in the future uh, and you're and you're considering uh, this army, maybe there will be some weaknesses covered up by Warcry Warbands. Uh, maybe there will be some a new expansion or some things that we can do uh, that weren't visible today. So uh, just yep. keeping that in mind. The, the Warcry Warbands, the ones I looked at, I've actually got them all open because I was going to talk about this, but the Warbands themselves aren't, um, you know, they're probably not going to blow you away. Um, they 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 basically marginally improve marauders, um, but some of the beasts are quite interesting. So the furies in there, um, so they have the same ability that the skinks have, where you can in combat you can basically go, um, I'm going to retreat instead retreat of charge. fighting. Um, so that that's quite interesting. Um, yeah, so I think there's probably a spot for some of those little things, just to give you a few more little sort of utility pieces. Um, but so far they're not. Um, I don't think they're going to change the world in terms of their um, individual combat ability or anything, but um, there's certainly some interesting stuff in there. Yeah, and I'm already seeing some combinations in the chat that potentially people are thinking about. So uh, keep them in mind when you're building your Slaves to Darkness faction. Now, when you when it comes to actually swearing your allegiance, we obviously could go Grand Alliance Chaos. We could actually swear to any of the gods. Uh, but when we go with Slaves to Darkness, um, it's fair to say there is no terrain piece that you get with this faction. True? True. Nope. Um, no when you customize your faction, there is no sub allegiance. However, there are, when you start looking into the factions, um, units, you can do um, some markings. But before we get to that point, I want to kind of get a high level of what do I get as a Slaves to Darkness player when I swear my allegiance? And what are those benefits and rules and, and beautiful things I'm going to get, Sean? Uh, look, primarily from the command abilities and anyone who's read anything uh, relating to Slaves to Darkness in any of the you know, uh, new AOS or um, uh, previous to that, it, it maintains the flavour of what a Slaves to Darkness army is in the sense that if you're given a particular mark, then you get relevant benefits um, if you're within certain ranges of heroes or, or generals um, on the battlefield. Uh, the first general's handbook, I think, was better. Where obviously, if it's a, if it's corn allegiance, it's a it's a bonus to hit. I think reroll ones to hit. Uh, Nurgle is the wounds to hit. Uh, Zench is uh, saves of one. Sorry, and uh, Slanesh is run and charge of one. I believe um, the first GHB was pretty good. It was just a, a general uh, range. Uh, but then I think when we hit GHB two onwards. Uh, the range increased, but it was wholly within. Um, I think at that point it did hit a bit of a, um, a snag because I, it did increase, but only slightly. And I think we all understand the limitations of wholly within. I think it's better, and I think that's where we've been moving. Uh, but where you've gone from, a, say, a 7-inch um, a range to a 10-inch wholly within, uh, it, it really was a bit of a nerf going to GHB2. Uh, but in saying that, it, it does have its benefits. For me particularly, I run a lot of MSU and I have a number of small heroes across the, the, the game. So when I do provide a mark to some of those units, I do generally get it. But, you know, what are we looking at? A, a reroll one um, to wound uh, if, it's, if it's Nurgle, which I'm running a bit at the moment. So it's good. Um, not, it doesn't blow you away when you look at some of the new battle tomes. Um, the, the other key part is, and again, this, this really does fit within the, the flavour of Slaves to Darkness, where primarily, what are they? They're mortals trying to uh, get the gods' favour, really, and progress through uh, the levels of becoming a, you know, a warrior, a champion, um, a general, and you know, elitely a demon prince, really, um, and, uh, and moving towards that way. And the, the abilities sit in the um, general's handbook for them to do that as part of that allegiance ability. Primarily, it sits around if you're a hero and you kill another hero or monster, you roll a dice on a chart and you get a benefit. Um, it could be a plus one to wound for the rest of the game, uh, to, to hit for the rest of the game, or you can re-roll the next hit and wound, something like that. Um, if you fluff the roll, you could turn into a spawn. Um, if you roll really well, then you can become a demon prince. Um, so that's good. That's, that's not bad. It's been fairly consistent over the last couple of GHBs. Uh, however, I don't know how Travis feels. I've never used it. <laughs> um, it's never come up. And honestly, it probably has once or twice. But because I'm not used to it uh, coming up or looking out for it, I've probably overlooked it when I have had a general 
kill another monster because again the heroes and the the generals that I take aren't beastic. They they you could probably get them really tanky to to knock out a few big heroes or monsters, but generally you'd have to arm them up pretty well with certain artifacts to do so. Um, and really to do all that and get maybe a plus one to wound for the rest of the game when you're in turn four. Uh, Again, it hasn't come up. So, again, when you compare that to a few of the other Allegiance abilities you see in some of the new battle tones, uh, it's yes, it ke- keeps with the flavor of it, but it's very weak. But I'll see what Travis's thoughts are on it. Uh, yeah, I've, I've rolled on that table, I think, three times. Um, and I've rolled uh, the, the, the middle result, which is basically you get to re-roll the next failed hit, wound, or save. I think twice and once I got, like, plus one wound or something like that. Um it, it doesn't come up very often. Um, you, 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 you have to get lucky, but you have to really pick your target to actually go and kill a hero or monsters. Mm. Not an easy thing to do. Like it's not like you've got, um, you know, uh, so pick another army that's got a really choppy character. It's not like you're running around with a bloodthirster or something like that that's going to go in and smash something. You, you, your heroes and they're not. They're not going to blow the world away. Um, so yeah, that that half of it is certainly. Um, the allegiance ability is kind of you know there um the so other don't, so part, don't rely on the eyes of the gods really, really. No. it's not it's, it's yeah. not a strategy that you you know you're thinking about right i'm going to put the sort of judgment on this hero he's going around slaying all these heroes and he's going to turn into a demon prince or you know a whole bunch of spawns it's not something that's likely going to happen yeah I, I wouldn't would definitely not be banking on it um, no. and then as for the actual um the other part of the allegiance ability the mark um I found that a lot of the time that ends up doing nothing um, since they made it wholly within, um, especially if you have like a unit that makes a charge, but then the hero, they leave the hero behind and all of a sudden it all comes to nothing sort of thing. Um, I, it's in terms of the strength of the overall strength of the allegiance abilities, it's definitely not up there with something like, um, you know, I don't know, like Daughters of Cain or something like that. I mean, that's an extreme example, but even something even a little bit stronger, um, a little bit weaker, sorry. Um, do, yeah. you fi- do you find something like, because when I'm, I'm looking over the battle traits now and I can see that, you know, Korn, Slanish, Nurgle and Zench are all wholly within eight, six, seven or nine, which are the, the numbers that are uh, associated with, you know, Zench is nine and he's wholly within nine. But the unmarked or no mark, um, which is plus one bravery, is within 12. Do you find that is more beneficial? Do you think something like that, because it's got a larger radius, you don't need the plus one bravery characteristic? Or are you just finding it challenging to keep within the holy within since we've changed? Definitely a challenge to keep the holy within. Um, The plus one bravery is nice, but I'm not actually sure you really need it. It's not like your bravery is actually that low. I think marauders are bad, but, you know, they're marauders, whatever. Um, but even your your chaos warriors and stuff, I think, start on a seven. Um, uh, the knights are a seven, goes to an eight by the time you put the um, the banner and stuff in there. Um, so it's not like your bravery is actually terrible anyway. Um, so yeah, and it's certainly an option, I guess, if you wanted to protect yourself a little bit more that way. But I'm, I don't think you'd get much out of it overall. Maybe having one less model run away, sort of thing. But yeah. And before we move to the next question, I might throw it over and ask, do you guys have a preference when it comes to the markings? Do you have one? Is it something that you is it something that you you, you choose at the start of the game? Is it something that you have to declare on a uh, an army list when you submit it to a tournament? Um, and if so, which ones are the ones that you like better? Sean? Uh, yes, to the question on uh, submission for to a lot of tournaments, um, you sort of you're working with your um, uh, your army builders, and a lot of them require you to to put the markings down, which is fine. It's good. Um, it's not something that I would see a benefit on in terms of chopping and changing within a tournament. To look at you know look at a competitor and go, ha, I'm going to now change it. And obviously the paint scheme you want it to uh, look like um, a particular marking as well going into a tournament. Um, that being said, uh, for me, look, I'm, it depends on what I'm running. At the moment, I'm running a lot of MSU uh, 
Chaos Warriors, and I think we know that the one of the, the key uh, weaknesses for a Chaos Warrior is the wound roll on, on a four up. Uh, so I tend to favour towards Nurgle at the moment. So I do get that reroll ones to wound. Um, so that's sort of uh, where it sits. But if I was playing a different style with maybe more Marauders or something like that, the unmarked bravery, because there are other ways through artifacts uh, and uh, command abilities to increase uh, that uh, uh, bravery buff uh, that could be an option if I was running again large units of it as well um, but yeah depends on what I'm running but currently Nurgle Mark is is working well for the the units that I'm, I'm running with at the moment and just clarity for anyone who doesn't know what MSU stands for that is multiple small units so that's essentially if a if you're looking at War Scroll Builder and um, uh, a unit comes as five models or ten models, uh, but you can obviously increase the size. Uh, we're saying that you take the minimum, uh, uh, the minimum size of the unit, or yeah, it's a small unit. Uh, and Trav, yourself, um, is there a marking that stands out uh, more than others for yourself? Um, for me, because of the, just the way the army functions, I, uh, I, I mean, you're probably looking at either Nurgle or Corn. Um, it's a combat army, let's face it. So I, I mean, think I, I would always sort of think you'd lean towards one of the things that enhances that. Um, the Slanish one to do, I think, with Battle Shock, you know, kind of here and all there. Um, the Zench one ups your resilience a little bit, I guess. But um, I think overall you, you, you're always going to lean towards one of those two. Um, yeah. Yep, not great. Um, so we, we probably, we've chosen the allegiance. We're like, right, uh, I'm definitely slaves to darkness as opposed to, uh, going corn or zench. Um, we're going to start building a list and I'd love to hear your thinking around like hero choices and, and units and markings and all that good stuff. So maybe we'll start at the top of the tree, which is our heroes. Um, unless the battalions, do you guys use battalions at all? Or do you find them, uh, beneficial in a, uh, an army? Yes, yes. Trav, yourself? Because you've got three you've got three battalions. Um, yeah, so one of the changes I guess that kicked in in the last handbook was um, you used to be able to take the ones out of um, the uh, Chaos of Legions ever chosen, but you can't ever chosen. Um, so yeah, you've got a couple to pick from. Um, I think probably one that stands out for me, and I can't remember the name of it now, that I have actually used before. Um, where essentially you get to fight in the hero phase. Um, you can pick a unit and fight in the hero phase. Um, but, um, yeah, so there's probably there's probably one or two of those that are decent. Um, there's one I always, I can't, I can't remember which one it is, I always look at it and just go, I'm not sure why you'd ever take it. Um, but you've, um, got, you've got Godsworn Champion of Ruin, uh, God's Wrath Warband, and then the Runebringer Warband. I think it's the Runebringer one that always just look at it and go, I'm not sure why you'd use it. But um, the other two are interesting um, and maybe have a place here. Sean, what's the one that you like? Yeah, my favourite is it's not the one Travis doesn't like, thank God. Um, it's the God's Wrath. Um, again, it is a bit of a novelty and uh, I always saw it that way until it actually won me one of the games in Cancun, independently of anything else. So for that reason alone, I... Uh, I feel as though that it's fine, it's good. It gets me uh, pretty much nearly the entire army in a one drop. Um, so know, what does it do? Yeah, so primarily you have to have a war shrine and you have to have a chaos lord on Manticore. So going back to your question about your hero choices, that sort of makes it for you. Uh, and if you're after a beat stick hero um, that can do a, some damage, um, then he's probably your best bet. And then you can have as many units as you want from the listing of warriors, chosen, chariot, um, not marauders, um, but a, a few other units to that effect. And primarily all it does is in the hero phase, um, the war shrine absorbs all the energy of all of the uh, units in that battalion, excluding itself within 24 inches. So with the MSU I'm running, sorry, as many as you want, but it has to have a minimum of eight. So it is quite a large um, uh, battalion. So generally you're rolling about 10 to 12 dice uh, at the start of the game. goes down, obviously, as you lose units or get out of range throughout the game. Um, every six, uh, you can then choose an enemy unit that's in line sight of the War Shrine and do D3 mortal wounds. Again, not game-breaking, but um, like I said, in a particular game, I think it was right nice to the heart, where there was a standoff. Um, I was sitting back rolling, you know, three or four sixes each turn. I was rolling well and just throwing long range 
D3 mortal wounds at small MSU units and got enough points at the end of the game to win. So, um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. A lot of times it doesn't do much, but it, it adds a little bit of flavor. And, again, it gets me the artifact. It gets me a low drop, um, and it's a bit of fun. And it's also going to be really handy late game to take that hero out that's got one or two wounds maybe hiding and you're just like, I need to get that objective or stop yeah. that buff. And that one to two model wounds could yeah. uh, could really change the game. The other thing too with it is, and the benefit I have with Enslaves the Darkness is I actually don't take a Nurgle War Shrine. I take a Zench one and he's the only Zench. I know it's it's blasphemy, but I just put it in that he's been uh, he's uh, he's been taken by the Nurgle uh, as part of the, uh, the law behind it. And... Uh, the reason why I do that, and I get a lot of questions in a lot of the, the Slaves to Darkness um, Facebook groups about why have you just randomly gone Zench for that War Shrine? It's because even though it doesn't do a lot, when you explain it to your opponent, it sounds terrible. So that War Shrine becomes a big target. So for being Zench, I can have his prayer go off, which if he's Zench means he can reroll save rolls, and I put it on himself. So knowing that he's generally going to be a target um, for a lot of the opponents, I keep him as Zench, I give him the uh, his ability on himself, so he's a four-up re-rolling failed, and he's got his own six-up because he's in range of himself. It keeps him around a lot longer, and uh, even if I get a really heavy army that, that takes him out in one or two turns, they focused on that and not everything else, and really, it, it doesn't do a lot. It just sounds worse than what it is. So are you marking individual units and, and then choosing something different as an allegiance? I'm... Uh, or is it, or, or does your allegiance dictate the choice in the unit? I think this is nice to to clarify. Uh, the allegiance doesn't require any requirements for ter- certain marks. By so if means. I'm, uh, let's let's say for example, I choose slaves to darkness, and I say I'm I'm no mark. Um, we'll start there. You don't even have to do that. You can just say you're slaves to darkness and have a mix of no marks, uh, zench, corn, whatever you want. I think that's the benefit. You can. Synergy-wise, it's not great, really, um, because you obviously want certain units that can synergize, be it, you know, if it's Nurgle, it's, you know, re-roll, ruin, ruin rolls at one, so it's not game-breaking. But the synergies do help. So it's not generally good to have a, a lot of different types in it. Um, I just found for that one particular unit, um, I got more of a benefit. And like Travis says, it's uh, the War Shrine is not really a tank piece. So giving it the Mark of Nurgle to get a re-roll wound rolls of one isn't really going to do a lot for it in terms of damage output. So knowing it's a bit of a target in that battalion, the Zench tends to um, play the play the game a little bit better. Not great it- Great. And it's good to understand this because someone might think I've, I've chosen a mark and my whole army kind of has to go down that path, which often, uh, you know, people's sub allegiances might dictate the, the structure of the army. But it sounds like under Slaves to Darkness, uh, you have a, a, a buffet of different options. And if you want to have like a story that's like a collection of, um, of, of chaos and, you know, you've got one that's Mark Slanesh and you've painted them up pink and then you've got another one that's blue for Zench you've got that option to have like a nice mixed force. Is it as competitive as it would be to kind of go niche as one? No, but you've got that creative freedom. Is that correct? That is. And I dare say that may change a bit. When you look at some of the newer books coming out, like uh, Beasts of Chaos and so forth, I'm going to assume that some of the new battalions, if and when we do get a new battle tone, will probably take some of that away and, and make it a little bit more uh, like, you know, your, your Fate Swarm and your, and your Plague, uh, Plague Touch, which are still around. And they're probably, I'd say, going to, my assumption would be that would be more the flavor of any new battle to- uh, um, uh, battalions coming into any new books. But, but currently, the way they stand uh, under General Slaves of Darkness, you've got a lot of freedom to do that um, if and when it's of any benefit. Yep, and if, if we do get a combined book, of, you know, there are rumours. Uh, I'm sure we'll, re- we'll re- revisit this topic. Um, so when we start building a Slaves to Darkness army, um, you've obviously got a lot of hero choices. I'm counting 12. Um, where do you guys start? Like, what are some of the – maybe I'll throw to Travis first. What, yep. What's a hero choice that you really like and, uh, and why? Um, so it depends a little bit on what you want to put in your army to some extent. So um, some of the – command abilities that the Chaos Lords, the different flavors of Chaos Lords have are quite specific. So for example, um, there's Chaos Lord on Demonic Steed, uh, which is basically a mounted Chaos Lord on horse. Um, his command ability only works on knights and chariots. So to some extent, you need to have a bit of a think ahead about what you're actually gonna 
sorry, uh, on what you're actually going to put in your army. Because if, you, if you're going to take a very knight heavy army with lot, you know, a couple of units of knights and maybe, you know, three or four chariots, he's probably going to be the one, he's probably going to be one that you want to put in. Um, whereas if you are going to take more of a, um, uh, let's say, an army with warriors and guys on foot, I think it's the, uh, maybe it's the one on, I can't remember exactly, but I think it's the one on the Manticore that, um, that buffs Chaos Warriors. Um, so so you, to some extent, you need to have a bit of a think about what the rest of your army is going to look like, and that'll sort of maybe dictate your choice a little bit. Um, they're all pretty similar in terms of what they actually do themselves. Um, so they're all... Um, I'd say moderate damage output. Um, like they're not going to all of a sudden take down a, a, you know, an enemy monster in one turn or something like that. That they just don't have that output ability. Um, there's a, a the chaos lord on foot can maybe do it, but you have to get pretty lucky. Um, uh, it, so that you're not, they're not going to be like a central beat stick model that's going to go. You're going to hurl him into the enemy army and he's going to clean up half of it before he slowly gets taken down, sort of thing. That's just not the role. Um, that their combat characters fulfil. Um, so you have sort of that combat lord and you have sort of your sorcerer lords as well. Um, less options in that in that boat, but um, so you've basically got one on foot and one on a monster. Um, the one on foot has um, probably one of the most interesting spells in the... Well, it's not like there's actually a spell law for Slays the Darkness, but um, they certainly have one of the most interesting spells um, floating around. So they have a... Uh, re-roll ones to hit, wound, and save. So it's a general buff that they can put on a unit um, that that um, sort of helps them out quite a lot. So it's not like they just re-roll to hit or something like that. Um, they actually get quite a lot out of it. Um, and then the um, the Sorcerer Lord on the Manticore has a, um, uh, a can be quite high damage um, or wound spell. But again, it's not like you're you don't have an individual law. So you've only really got these couple of extra spells to play around. And again, I think that would kind of influence what you might choose, depending on what the rest of your armor is going to have in it. Um, obviously, the Manticore is a monster. Um, it's got a sorcerer on top, so it's not going to be hugely combat focused. Um, but, you know, that might combo well with something else you've got going on or, you know, just how you want to play your army sort of thing. Um, and then you've got sort of the lesser characters as well. So you've got your... Um, You've got like your uh, Chaos Champion, I think they're called, uh, which is sort of the old, if you think back to old world, it's essentially the, the hero level character instead of the lord level character. So he's he's got a few extra attacks. He's got some nifty like little abilities that might pay off once or twice. But again, they're not going to rip apart enemy units on their own or anything like that. They're, they're definitely sort of middle of the pack in terms of their, their abilities. Well, that's certainly what I find as well. Yeah. So what you're kind of telling me is that um, the hero choices are not an, uh, a piece in the puzzle that you build around. You know, it's not Marathi, and then we're kind of building around Marathi to get the best out of her or Bloodthirster or a Keeper of Secrets. That What I'm hearing is that the, the hero choices are more support and, you know, really synergizing and buffing your army uh, as opposed to building around it. Is that is that is that fair? Yep, definitely. They're definitely more, they fall more into that support category and, and how they fit with the rest of your army compared to them standing on their own. Um, Fair call. Yeah. And I, and look, in talking to some of the other generals um, in from the Chaos factions, um, the, the Chaos Lord on Manticore uh, seems like a really good ally choice that people are talking about. And Sean, I know you have been quite successful with your Chaos Lord on, on, uh, on Manticore. Um, do you, do you build around it? Is this like a must include in your army? Uh, it is at the moment, mainly because of the battalion I'm using and it's a requirement. Prior to that, when I was branching out to, uh, say, Zench um, in using that as a battalion, I, I used it quite heavily with a large block of warriors because, as Travis mentioned, his, their command ability is quite good because, you know, it, it's interesting because it's I don't know if there are many other command abilities that only work on one unit. Uh, which this does. So it only works on the Chaos Warriors. But it is a good one because um, if they're in range uh, and the hero fades from memory, uh, it gives the Warriors reroll uh, charge rolls, reroll wound rolls, and I believe reroll battle shock as well. So yeah. it's quite good on a block as well. So when I was running under Fate Swarm, what's that, 28 um, Chaos Warriors, um, giving that to them and then throwing them forward with sail was fantastic because they're on a three up to hit uh, a four up to wound with a reroll and then a minus one ren so they were quite a beat stick under that 
Now, um, not so much. Uh, so I, even when I'm running him at the moment, I very rarely use that command ability, again, because I am currently running that MSU small unit style, so it doesn't have the same impact. Um, that's good. The, the spell that Trav mentioned with the uh, uh, Sorcerer Lord on Manticore is good too. Again, I ran that more under Zench because it's funny when you put two Destiny dices of two sixes on that spell. Uh, it's quite good because then you're rolling uh, 12 dice. Every five is a mortal wound. Every six is D3 mortal wounds. So it has the potential. But again, when you do that, you generally only roll one or two fives or sixes and fluff the whole thing. Um, the other one that Travis didn't mention, which I think is quite good, is the Demon Prince. Um, I tend to look at uh, from a more of a support piece in the sense that it's quick. Um, I don't know anyone who wouldn't run it without the wings because you do have that option. So it has a movement 12. But where I run it currently, um, it has a really good way of getting across the board quick, flying over those units and hitting some uh, low to mid-range heroes in the background um, because he can be quite damaging either with the sword or the axe. Um, nothing on anything major, uh, but you can if you can get into some of those support heroes in your opponent's army uh, with the mobility you have with the Demon Prince, uh, that's probably one of the other heroes that I think stands out and, and can play a big benefit to a Slayer of the Darkness army. And he's got he's got a nice little heal as well. Where if he if he kills a a model uh, or a hero, he heals either one or d three wounds, um, uh, which is which is a nice little touch. Yeah, if you if you have him unmarked. Um, again, oh, is that an have, unmarked? Is it? Yeah, if he's unmarked, which is interesting because I've run him previously um, with the newer um, artifact, which was uh, the Mark of War Favors, because it makes him a little bit more beat stick. He's in range of himself but um, it pretty much gives him all the uh, keywords. So it ends up meaning he can reroll ones to hit, wound, save, uh, and I believe to run and charge, which is really good. But it's interesting with the change from last year's GHB to this GHB, um, the Mark of All Favours was only one of the three key changes to the Slaves of Darkness, and it now states that if you give a model that artefact, they can no longer take a Mark of Chaos. So um, now it's interesting where I, I have, may have had the Demon Prince with the markers Nurgle. So he had a plus one to wound, uh, sorry, a plus one save. So he'd be a three up re-rolling ones, making him a little bit more tanky. I can't do that anymore. So I actually have to give him that uh, non-mark ability, which is a uh, uh, heals one wound if he kills a model or D3 if he kills a monster or a hero. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and for 160 points, a standalone hero, you know, he's got some good, uh, it has a good uh, uh, series of attacks and um, it's, it's a hit and wound is, is, is pretty generous. So um, I think it's a, a nice little choice. Um, one that, a choice that you used to see a lot um, back in the day, um, especially as an allied kind of piece. I don't know if you guys have had any experience with Sail the Faithless. Uh, especially, you know, I've, I remember people picking up, you know, units of chosen or knights and just kind of slinging them up the board. Um, any thoughts on something like Sail the Faithless, which is a uh, Forge World model? Um, the the problem with him now, um, uh, word problem may not be the right way to describe it, but um, the issue I have with him now is you used to be able to. So Sail has a little pet spawn that hangs out with him. Um, called Between night and night more. Yeah, um, Nightmare yeah. that hangs out with him. Um, you used to be able to take just sail, so you just buy sail and leave the spawn at home because it was just a slightly improved spawn, which one off isn't going to really do much. Um, but you can't do that anymore. You now have to take both, um, which means you're investing 200 points in that ability to hurl a unit across the battlefield. Um, 200 points is a lot for a teleport that that some other armies just get through abilities and that's part of my allegiance or, you know, I'm Sylvaneth, I'm going to teleport through the woods. So you're paying a lot of points to fill a hole and even then it's a spell that you have to cast so somebody could unbind it. Yep. Um, or, you know, if you're, if you're in range of a knight and canter or something, you might just go, well, you're not going to do that. And, you know, I guess that's probably your fault for being in range of a knight and canter. But, um, you know, it, it's it's something that, that can definitely be stopped. Um, which not always those sorts of abilities can. So I think you're paying a lot of points for something that's not guaranteed. Um, and personally, I don't think it's a good use of points, but um, yeah. But you guys did talk about resilience, uh, especially like your Chaos Warriors. So uh, there might be some combinations. Again, I'm, I'm not the expert, um, 
But uh, yes, you have, uh, you know, I have noticed that uh, sale is not as popular as it was in, say, GBH 17. Uh, and even 18, there was like a little bit of him, but not as much as he, he was almost like an auto include in every Zench army back in the day. Yeah, I do use him. Um, but I agree with everything Travis has mentioned. I use him with a bit of. Uh, with a bit of disdain, unfortunately, because of that, that joining, because it, it does make it very hard. Um, but I actually find that although 200 is, is overkill, he's more resilient now, uh, by no means any quicker. Um, but what I've found is it provides at least that threat. Um, there aren't a lot of flying opportunities beyond the manticores. So uh, where we currently have a lot of the um, current games where you can move off objectives. Keeping sail backboard with a small unit of warriors or something like that at least provides the threat within the game that, hey, you leave a unit backboard. If you don't, I'm going to whip a unit f over, the, over the top of you and take that objective and at least add something to the game and helps change some of the tactics of your opponent. Is that worth 200 points? Probably not. Uh, for me, I'm very interested to see what some of these new endless spells that have come out uh, recently, because I know there's a lot of movement shenanigans as part of that, and I understand. I haven't looked a lot into it. We're talking some about the Uber, the Uber driver in the bridge? Possibly. Um, yeah. I understand that there's some mimicking to what Sal does. So, you know, is it possible to get a slightly cheaper uh, sorcerer? Um, and with that endless spell and, and have the same benefit, maybe at a, at a lower casting cost, that's a bit easier. Um, so that's something I'd look into. Uh, but like I said, I do use him at a necessity because of the, you know, warriors have a movement of five, you know, plus one um, with, the, with, the, with the drummer. But they're not quick. Um, and unless you are running a heavy marauder, horseman, knight, uh, style army, uh, which you probably do have a little bit more mobility. I, I find if you've got a lot of on foot troops, it's hard not to use someone like Sale to have that uh, movement uh, maneuverability around the board. I, I will say, as a Gloom Splite player, and I do have that nine inch teleport that's very similar, to, if not the same as Sale, uh, I have won a bunch of games with a late turn of uh, kind of throw it throw them uh, a, a small unit, keep them at the back of the board, throw them up the, and, you know, claim that objective late because they've forgotten about it or uh, they've, they've kind of tried to screen too much. And um, I've, I've been able to, I guess, maneuver around it. So um, not completely useless, but I think you guys have raised really valid points that uh, there are now some additional teleporting style uh, movement uh, abilities. Um, so look at sale versus your Uber driver or your, um, uh, or your bridge, um, which we which we know from Forbidden Power. Yeah, and look, my only other point on that is that where I used to play Sail before the change, where you had to include the Night Mortar now, I probably feel a lot more comfortable throwing him up the board than keeping him back because he can actually throw any wounds against him across to the Night More on a um, on a four plus, and then the Night More has a five up mortal wound save and he heals wounds every turn as well. So it actually has made Sal a lot more resilient. So you can keep him in pace with your army up the board and don't feel as though you actually have to keep him at the back of the board uh, as a bit of a, a weak um, character piece. Fair enough. What about what about the Dark Oath um, choices? You've got your Dark Oath Chieftain, you've got the War Queen. Um, any experience with that or any thoughts, especially now that we're getting some more expansion through Warcry? Uh, is this something that we should be thinking about or um, is it only good like under certain builds? Travis, you want to take uh, that? Personally, I haven't used the walking. I just want to double check what her ability. I think there was a reason why I didn't take her. I just want to double check what her command ability is. Reroll charge rolls from memory. We're talking about the war queen here, right? Not the yeah, so the, the dark earth war queen. Um, yeah, so yeah, so um, you can reroll failed charge rolls. A friendly yeah, place to dump this unit is holding within 12. within twelve. But it says if this model is your general, um, so. She has to be a general to give you the to use her command ability, which is why I just went, nah, pass. Because your general then has five wounds on a five up save and has to run up the board to to keep units holding within twelve. Um, it, it's it's not great. So um, no, so no, just flat out no. And she's got four attacks, threes and threes, and ran one damage one. So she's at best going to put through four wounds a turn. I yeah. 
just no, <laughs> she's she's not very good, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what about the chieftain? Have we thought any any thoughts on the chieftain? Uh, I've actually never even looked at him. I can't. I don't even know what he does. You know, he does. No, he's, no, he's he, f- he follows the same suit of a lot of some of those on foot chaos heroes that are uh, hero killers, potentially monster killers. Get buffs on those. Can reroll like the exalted type of thing, exalted um, champion. So again, on foot, relatively squishy from memory. Um, doesn't provide an aura of any type of buff to uh, any other units from memory. Again, like I said, I haven't used him. Uh, I, I could see if, depending on what type of battle tome may or may not come out, relating to either Dark Oath, um, Slaves, or Combined Force, I feel as though there may be some more benefit to either one of those two models in certain builds. But I'd say as it stands at the moment, you know, I, I sit with Travis. I haven't even looked at them because I don't feel as though they provide any benefit to the army. I mean, they're a cheap hero at 80 points apiece. And, you know, the, um, the Chieftain's not bad. I mean, for 80 points... Um, if he charges, he, he you know, he, he can do a little bit of damage and he has some nice little benefits, uh, but he's, you know, he's hitting on fours mostly, you know, very, very low, if any, rend, uh, depending on which attack you're looking at, and the damage is one. So as he does more damage, um, he gets better, uh, but I, I think he's a nice little hit the flanks, find a really vulnerable, cheap unit, do some damage, power him up. But uh, if I'm thinking about my 80 points, uh, it, where is it better invested? An endless spell or um, one of these heroes, I'd probably say an endless spell right now. Yeah. So, certainly depends. Again, though, it comes back to what you want to actually get out of your army. Um, certainly if you are if you want to make a cool little, um, you know, thematically themed force of, um, you know, you could certainly take, you know, some Marauders, um, the Chieftain, the War Queen. Um, there's Shadespire Warband as well, uh, which I just want to double-check the name on. So the Godsworn Hunt. Um, you know, you could certainly build a really cool little thematic army there, but you got to be realistic about what it is. Um, it's a bunch of human models that are going to be rocking, you know, one wound with a five up save, obviously some more wounds for a character, but they're not going to be, you know, blowing things out of the water. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly so there's some cool little stuff you could do in there. You could build a really cool, like, you know, barbarian themed raiding party force type thing. I think that'll look really cool on tabletop, but, you know, if we're talking um, combat performance here, there's you need to be realistic about what you're going to get for your for your um, for your points. Yeah, Trav, that'd look good turn round, turn one, but it wouldn't be that much. Yeah. <laughs> turn two might be a different story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If I was going to go an eighty point hero, I think for me personally, Slambo was the one that kind of stands out at that eighty point yeah. level. Uh, again, the, the, obviously the conversation is, do I better invest that in a command point or an endless spell? But when you look at Slambo, uh, like Sean, I can see you're you're nodding away. Mm. Um, like, yeah, he's a bit of an internet meme, but, um, that's not a bad war scroll. It's the best of the, the, the 80 uh, point heroes, let's put it that way. Yeah. I mean, like if he, if he charges, he gets to pile in attack twice. Uh, if he, uh, I think he's, he, he, if he kills a hero or a monster, he doubles his attacks. He adds one, two hit rolls. Uh, if he's targeting a hero or a monster, um, uh, he's, he's down, he can do D3 damage. Like he, it's. He's a, it's not bad. Yeah. He is not bad for, for 80 points. No, no. But honestly, one of the, I think if we're looking at those 80 points, the Exalted uh, Hero, I think, sounds good because I think from memory you actually have to declare, if you kill a hero, you have to declare that you're, you're cutting out its heart with the thrice damn dagger from memory, uh, which gives you some benefits next time you attack something. But I think that in itself is pretty cool. Yep. So the exalted hero can be uh, can have the thrice damned dagger at the mm-hmm. at the end of the combat phase to cut the heart out of one enemy hero or monster slain by. Oh my gosh! Mm. Who says Who says Games Workshop's PC mm. ripping the heart out of your opponent? That's any true. any other call outs? Or I guess you know, if I was building a Slaves to Darkness army, um, what are some of the heroes that you probably almost are uh, auto include? And conscious of, you know, these guys are very uh, buffed, synergizing with the unit choices. And uh, we're about to talk units in a second. Um, which are the ones that probably I should maybe go out and buy or maybe uh, would, 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 uh, sh- could be included in multiple versions of lists? Um, I think if you're taking any, like even a single unit of knights, the Chaos Lord on the Demonic Steed um, is good. Um, his command ability is one of the ones that allows you to stack it at the moment. So you could, um, you know, 
it gives you plus one to hit and reroll charge. Obviously, the reroll charge doesn't stack, but the plus one to hit does. Um, so you can get your knights down to quite a low to hit value, um, which is or you can easily get into a two plus really. But um, and even overcome some minus one to hit. So like I know I've thrown my unit of knights into a, a unit of um, uh, goblins or gloom spike gits with the nets in the front. So everything's minus one to hit, but you just double stack the buff and you're still hitting on twos anyway. Um, so uh, you, you can certainly overcome some of that stuff. Um, I think this Chaos Sorcerer Lord is, um, he's not super cheap. Um, he's not a cheap wizard like some other factions have access to, but um, he has that cool, um, so he has his demonic power spell, so the reroll ones to hit wound save, but he also has an inbuilt, effectively um, mystic shield ability that he doesn't have to roll for, he just picks a unit and puts it on him. Um, so he has a quite a he has a couple of little sort of utility things he can do, um, which is nice. Um, so I'd probably always want to put one of them, one of each of them in. I guess if I had knights, definitely the one on horse. Um, I'd always keep a sorcerer lord and hanging around somewhere. Um, the other one, um, if we're just talking about slaves to darkness characters, I, I, I guess the rest comes down to what you're actually wanting to put in your army. Um, but then obviously you've got your ally choices as well, but we'll come to that later, I suspect. Yeah. And and Sean, any hero choices that you that really stand out for you before we move into units? No, I think Travis hit it. Um, if you're you're running the the mounted, you, you get the um, the Lord on uh, demonic seed. If you're running warriors, the the Lord on the Manticore. Uh, the uh, Demon Prince, if you want some um, mobility and some backfield um, damage to to lower range models. Um, and yeah, the demon, the uh, sorcerer lord on foot. Um, again, I agree with Travis, but it's either going to be am I buffing a, a monster or or something that's going to you know benefit um, to do additional damage, or do I have some large units, a large unit that I could throw that on to make it you know really beat stick? If I don't have one of those two, I'd keep it out. If I do, which you, you generally would, then then it's probably a, a key piece to have in the army. Yeah. No, great call. Great call. And I think, the, again, this is uh, thinking about this is an army that you don't build around your hero choices unless, obviously, it's a battalion and you're forced. This is really about optimizing your your your, 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 uh, blah, 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 your unit choices. Mm. Um, speaking of unit choices, you have um, four battle line choices. Um, two are inherent to Slaves to Darkness. Two are just generic for Chaos. So you've got your Chaos Warriors, you've got your Marauders, uh, then you have your Marauder Horsemen. Oh, you've got five, actually. Chaos Knights and your Chaos Chariots. Um, so maybe we'll start talking about the most common, which is obviously the Chaos Warrior, uh, a, a absolute um, a unit that is has been around since the dawn of time. Uh, do we like them? Uh, why do we like them? How many do we need to have in our army? Um, Sean, I'll throw it to you because I know you're a big Chaos Warrior fan. <laughs> oh, if only I could show you the cabinet. Um, <laughs> it's uh, yes, I have a lot uh, at the moment. Uh, people might find that very strange because I think people know that you know, in comparison to a lot of other units, in particular battle line, they're not great. Um, but they're resilient, and then we go back to what we said at the start. You know, they do have the five um, five up mortal wound save, uh, and when you're buffing it with with other pieces as well, including the war shrine, they are very resilient. Uh, Damage-wise, very poor unless you can work it around to um, get a lot of buffs for them. Three up to hit, uh, four up to wound, uh, no rend, one damage uh, with two attacks. Um, so you're generally not putting a lot of damage out um, unless you've got some some bonuses, uh, in particular to wound. Uh, but they're, they're a fun piece and they're, they're good at um, holding up lines as well. Like when you're looking at the battle line and what a lot of people use battle line units for, they are fantastic at, at holding the ground, keeping uh, certain enemies at bay, and they I guarantee they'll last that one extra turn longer than your opponent wants them to. And that is just enough for them to have to change the gameplay. It may provide you that extra turn to have enough points on the board to uh, pip the game at the end by a couple of points. Um, it may mean you may have no, no models on the table by the end and your, your opponent may have a lot, which happens a lot, but it may be enough to win you the game or, or have to change your opponents. Uh, they might change their tactics because of the level of resilience that they do, um, do, uh, they do have. And that, that, their, um, their rune shields are just, uh, they're a nightmare. You know, you're essentially saving one in every three. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. Mortal wounds are great. Rends, I hate. Rends terrible. 
um, with them, but you throw a lot of mortal wounds at it. I love it. I don't mind it. But the, their base save is four plus, which is uh, which is quite quite decent. Uh, Trav, any thoughts on on Chaos Warriors? Yeah, no, I, I like them for their resilience. Um, you know, like um, Sean said, you're not going to get huge damage output out of them. They they just they don't have the weapons for it. But um, I, you can under certain circumstances, but it's difficult to do. Um, I, I like them for their resilience. They I found as said it back at the start, ten of them will stand on an objective for a surprisingly long time. Um, and people will i have caught people out who think oh, I'll just go in and clean up these 10 cars for no worries you know it is actually 20 wounds with four up save and they are a little bit resilient to mortal wounds so all of a sudden they don't die quite as quickly as people think um, so yeah I, I think they're a, a solid choice and yeah. do we prefer the uh, the hand weapon the halberd or the grand blade the great blade sorry um, hit out uh, it's pretty much sword and board, so the shield for me. Um, because from memory, the other two, it's not like you're actually getting a huge damage output anyway with the the extra weapons. Like it's not like all of a sudden you everything's you know got an extra damage two. I think from memory. No, they're all damage one, but the great blade yeah. has rend one, and it's a little bit easier to wound. But the the hand the hand weapon is easier to hit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, still, I'd still probably say sword and shield every time, but. Sean? Agreed, 100%. Uh, Halberds, I think you get that two-inch reach, but, you know, a lot of the time you're not running um, Chaos Warriors in, you know, huge uh, units where you need that second line of um, uh, attacks. So, yeah, that's that's no good. I don't think I've ever run them without Sword and Board. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, you, you guys have talked earlier about this being uh, a unit that can take a lot of damage and is, is resilient. So I can see why you want to go the option with the, the sword and board just to keep as many on the table as possible. Uh, and then you start stacking it with, I'm sure we can talk about the shrines uh, and all that good stuff. But um, do you guys go uh, MSU? Do we go large blocks of them? Do we go uh, in a traditional 2K? Do we go three units of, uh, sorry, sorry, three units of them or... Um, like, what's the strategy behind uh, the Chaos Warrior? Um, for me, so in, certainly in the army that I'll play with, um, it was actually middle of the pack, so I think I had units of 10 for the most part. Um, I think originally I was running around a big unit of 20, but I found it too unwieldy, and most of the time half the guys didn't actually get to fight um, just because being on a 32 mil base with a one-inch reach, um, it's difficult to do, basically. <laughs> Um, so I, 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 I tend to run them around in units of 10. Uh, most of them still get a chance to swing, um, but it's also not five, which is sort of can deteriorate quite quickly. Um, just Maybe that's just a perception thing, but five I always look at and go, mm, it doesn't seem like it's going to do much. But um, So it's sort of middle of the range for me. Could be a nice little cheeky unit you want to throw, sail the, the, sail the Faithless or the little boatman to throw up the board sean where are you at with chaos warriors i i they could work either way like i said i previously ran them in fate swarm um quite successfully you know i'd use sales to throw a line of them right up the board uh right in front of my opponent after buffing them up and you know they had two attacks each um hitting on threes wounding on fours with a re-roll minus one rend uh, one damage, and then, you know, that would pump out a quite a bit of um, damage in itself. But then it didn't really matter because they're hitting a wall that was then a four-up save, five-up, um, uh, a five-up uh, mortal wound save, and then the war shrine with a six-up as well. So they didn't go anywhere, and it would take your opponent a good two or three turns to push through that line, and by that time I'd racked up enough points. So in a large block, they're quite good. The way I'm running them at the moment with because the way the battalion works, I'm running very much MSU with them. I think I have 10 units of five, which is pretty crazy, um, but successful. And I'm only successful because I run warriors as skinks. Um, I put them in there. They might kill one, uh, one, in, you know, maybe two, and then I, I run them out and then run another unit in their face and, you know, Slaves of Darkness. And that's where I'm having success generally with Slaves of Darkness. Um, I'm not going to kill a lot of opponents' uh, army. I know that going into the game. I don't even try. Um, and I, I'm all about mobility, moving around, claiming objectives, moving off, running around, which people don't expect with warriors. And giving, and that gives me that edge to be able to um, 
uh, get the heads up in, in a few different situations. It doesn't happen all the time, but, uh, you know, where the success has come with the army is using warriors as skinks, really. Hey, that, that is a very odd comparison that I don't yep. know how, how many other people would could look at look at a cow's warrior and go, yeah, it's a skink. No, it, it works. Um, it, it definitely works, um, strangely enough. Something you used to see uh, for a long time until they changed the minimum buy size is the cow's marauder. So you used to buy them in units of 10. Now I believe they are units of 20. Um, what do we think about them as a battle line choice? Uh, is 20 too much or let's max them out? Or like, what are, we, what are our thoughts on that, Sean? Uh, I, I like them. I do. Um, yes, took a bit of hit um, going from 10 to 20. Again, when I used, it, used them previously, they were um, in the small blocks of 10. Um, I'm happy to run them in 20. Um, I think their potential to have the both the, um, uh, the mark as well as the banner and the, the tribal banner and the other one to give them the, the add bonus to the battle shock as well as the, the reroll ones to hit um, makes them relatively resilient um, in certain builds and um, also can dish out quite a bit of damage in certain builds as well. You know, put them in with a, a Glockkin for, you know, whatever reason in an Urgle army, you know, you've got uh, an extra wound, um, you've got an extra hit as well. Um, put, Play, uh, putrefaction uh, on them, uh, blade, blades on them. You got the minus one rent. It's they, they can be quite good, really, in certain builds. Um, but I haven't really used them currently because of the the battalion I'm using. Do we take them as meat shields, Travis? Are they um, or are they there to serve another role? Um, so I I have a unit of twenty. Um, they I, I tend to use them as a. Um, for numbers because one of the things with the army is you don't unless you're looking at marauders so you get five cows warriors for 90 points um you are kind of low numbers on the table you're not going to get a huge horde of like you know goblins or something like that which is obviously the extreme example but um so i found that um the unit of 20 would a lot of the time just sort of hang around an objective um they tend to die pretty quick um if anything comes anything serious comes to get them um they can do a little bit of damage. Um, they have a, 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 an ability on their war scroll um, where they they their tribal sort of violence kind of thing because they're a pack of crazy berserker men. Um, they get to roll a dice, and if you if you get lucky with that, you can maybe do a bit of extra damage. You get some bonuses to hit and wound, um, but again, you're not going to expect the world out of them. So I tend to use the unit of twenty as numbers around objectives and anything else, and they tend not to fight unless it's a safe option for them. Um, or it's irrelevant whether or not they die, which is yeah. So we're taking them for objective claiming and, yeah. and the and the bodies more than anything. Yeah. Or as a speed bump so that something has to deal with them. No. And they and they could be a great uh, meat shield or something to put up and kind of um you know block up a, a whole bunch of the board as well. Um that's definitely an option. Yep. Um what about uh, before I go to the Chaos Knights, I want to talk about some of the other ones that you don't see very often. Uh, one is the Chaos Chariot. Um, what do we think of the Chaos Chariot? Is there a place for it? Uh, the Chaos Chariot's okay. Um, the Gorby's Chariot is better, though. Um, I think if you were seriously going to do Chariots, I think you'd be better off taking Gorby's Chariots. So the um, Gorby's Chariot obviously isn't battle line. Um, yeah, so that's the uh, that's the downside to it, though. But... Um, they're, they're okay. Um, they're not again, though. They're not. Um, they're not. Uh, you know. They're certainly not like a. Um, what are the other chariots? What's the um, the Zen the Slanish chariot called the. Oh, the exalt, exalted. Uh, yeah. The, the, sta the, stab yourself and bleed yeah, while you put it together. Whatever. Um, they think, I think they're quite cheap from memory. I think a chariot's only ninety. Uh, uh, chariots are eighty points. Eight. Um, or Gold I think beast. you can get three for two ten. Oh, do they get a horde bonus, do they? Uh, yeah, Chaos Chariots have a horde bonus. It says 210. I don't know exactly how much that is, but it's saying that it's 80 or 210. So yeah. I think you can take up to yeah. three, if I remember correctly. All right. Well, there you go. I did not know that they got a horde bonus, but um, no, there you go. You can have a horde bonus on your chariots if you want. Um, quite a large footprint in a chariot, though, um, so you they can be, again, a little bit unwieldy. Um, I have, not in my current army, but I have used the chaos chariots before um and sometimes found it difficult to get them into spots when you had more than one um, just because that is quite a large base um you know you're trying to 
it's it's a monster base effectively so you are trying to maneuver a bunch of monster bases together um uh, so yeah I like them um probably a place for them if you wanted to do a a fast moving sort of mounted army i think certainly you know some knights and marauder horse and some chariots with a couple of you know lords on steeds or a mandy or something like that would be really cool um so again again it kind of depends how you wanted to play the army i guess could be could be a nice little cheap easy uh objective stealer or something that kind of first turn runs up the board and um you know takes a little bit of damage uh it's cheap for 80 points yeah. Uh, like it's definitely a throwaway unit and it could help you start scoring early. Um, but like, certainly is it, would you build a, a whole army around chariots? Probably not. And if you were certainly, as you've mentioned, the gore beast chariot is probably a little bit better, but it's not battle line. So, yeah. uh, so just a consideration. Um, Sean, any, any thoughts about chariots or would you like to be my expert when it comes to Marauder horsemen, which I haven't seen since Warhammer fantasy. No, uh, Gore Beast and Marauder Horsemen are, 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 I must admit, units that I haven't utilised. Um, in terms of the Chariot, I think for me, you, you hit it on the head in terms of that um, uh, early game objective grabbing. That's where I've used it. Um, uh, Battle for the Past, Border War, others like that where I've taken first turn and pushed my army uh, to hold one of the middle objectives and my base, but then throw a um, Chariot up because I know it'll get there. It, it is not that great a damage output, but it is quick um, because you can declare in the movement phase that you are going to whip the horse, which gives you a bonus D6 to the movement. So I think it's a base eight. You've got your, your D6 for your run and an extra D6 for the whip. So you can feel fairly um, confident that it's going to make that objective for one to get you that point. But what I've also found is seven wounds with a four up save, especially if you can maintain, you know, some distance within nine inches to the war shrine. So it gives it the six up as well. You may get a lot of units cramming into that to get the objective back. Um, and you never know, it'll have the bodies to take it, but those units will be uh, locked in combat. You know, the, generally that, war, that um, chariot will last that turn and with maybe one or two wounds left, and then it'll force that unit, larger unit that's gone to that objective to have to sit there for another turn to deal with it, um, which is enough for you to position yourself so that you're that two points up to hold the other two. And if you can hold it to the end of the game, then that's 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 the game for you, really. So I've had a few games like that where I've thrown the, just the chariot up against that objective, get those points, hold it for one, maybe two turns if it does well. And uh, and like you said, just let it die and then focus on everything else. And because of the base size, it does take up a lot of space. So in certain uh, games where there is uh, – with the train positioning, you can turn it sideways, chaff up the line so that it stops the opponents getting around you too much. Yeah, I think that's um, a really good point is uh, if you're smart with it as well, you can definitely pin uh, an opponent, especially like you start tagging it on the side and uh, you know really restricting how many people could attack the chariot back. Um, before I ask you about Chaos Knights, I probably want to make a call out um, to to the uh, the Underworld's Warband, which I actually think is not bad. Uh, we didn't get to talk about her and um, the Godsworn, but um, her spell, the is it Feradra? I'm, I'm clearly butchering that. Um, but I I really like her spell. You know, she um, picks a unit within twelve inches, uh, an opponent's uh, unit, and uh, minus one to their wound rolls um, for their melee weapons, which um, which is pretty pretty tough. Um, like I've seen the impacts of my gloom spite with a minus one to hit. Uh, there's not a lot of buffs to my uh, to, to to wound. So when you start bringing that down, um, big impact. And I think the frost phoenix is one of those only other units out there that does a a, a neg to neg to wound. Um, have you guys had any experience or um, do you see value in something like a minus one to wound? I uh, ha haven't haven't used it. Um... Interesting spell, though. Um, certainly, I think, you know, it's a, it's a buff, you don't, and, sorry, a debuff you don't see very often. Um, you know, you've got the Phoenixes. Um, there's actually not much else that I can think of that's actually minus one to wound. You've got, there's there's the, also there's also not a lot to, that gives you pluses to, to wound as well. So that's where it kind of really can really make a mark. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, handy little need off to have for sure. Yeah. Um, um, Maybe. It's 150 though. That's I think that's the drawback. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah it's so maybe has a spot. But, um, mm. Yeah. Sean, you got an idea? 
No, it just it falls into the same uh, issue with sale and the night more. You know, you're not if it was just that model independently to get that buff, that's great. But you sort of have to take her with the wall band and invest that 150 points, which you know, not a lot when you think about what it could get out. Um, but again, I, I don't have those models yet, but it wouldn't hurt getting them and seeing how they uh, perform. Um, and considering the hundred, game. considering the 150 also comes with the God Sworn Hunt, which is going to protect her. Uh, mm. I actually think it could be a, a nice little viable um, unit to to include. Agreed. What are our thoughts on Chaos Knights? Uh, this is one of the definitely the most popular um, components of a uh, Slaves to Darkness from my my perception. Um, am I right, Sean, or am I wrong? No, they they have. A, I think historically um, they've been a, a again they have the resilience that you get out of the warriors. So. They've always had that with them, but in terms of damage output, I think historically they're uh, a point thump, really, that you're investing a lot of points and not really getting bang for your buck. But I think recently um, in certain other army builds, in particular Nurgle, um, I think it's come back quite a lot, especially with putting blades on them with the, the uh, uh, Lord on Demonic Mount to give that plus one to, to hit. Um, they're the type of scenarios and the synergies where I think have put the Knights uh, back into the favour of, of a lot of players. Um, taking those synergies away within Slaves to Darkness, um, still a, a better piece than what they previously have been, but again, they're not as powerful as what you get if you were to go through some of the other Gods Battalions. Trav, anything you'd add to the Chaos Knights, or are you a believer? Yeah, no, I, I like the knights. Um, you know, they they definitely have that resilience to them. So they have the shield, so they get the five up model wound save. Um, they're like every other cavalry model; they get the extra wounds. So they're three wounds a piece. So they, they're going to stick around for a while. Um, they are very much a when they're not on the charge, though. They just kind of don't really do much. Um, they will kind of just sit there and churn away slowly. Um, so I think you probably need to be careful with how you play them. Um, one thing that they do have, which can catch people out, is they have a, a minus one bravery debuff um, around them. So, um, you know, that, that can certainly, you know, you can get that extra model that runs away that, that um, it's, it's a little nice little thing that they play with as well. Um, and it synergizes reasonably well with some of the command traits and magic items as well. So you can actually get um a, a reasonable level of minus bravery um happening if you have a couple of things next to each other so um nice to have um but overall i think it's a decent unit and I'd, I'd, I'd rate them for sure awesome um outside of your uh your battle line choices you've got a couple of extra uh non-battle lines so you've got your chaos chosen you've got the gore beast chariots you have the chaos spawn and the war shrine um what are, is there any of those included in your lists? Why are they included? Um, what stands out? Um, Sean, I'll throw it to you first. Yeah, um, Chosen are a fantastic choice. Again, especially if you're running uh, Chaos Warriors um, because they have that ability where if they have slain a model um, in, the, in the combat phase, you'd obviously attack with them first. But then once they've slain a, a model, uh, then all other... Uh, units, Slaves of Darkness units, I believe, within a particular radius of them gets to reroll wound rolls. And when you have a lot of um, Chaos uh, Warriors with the wound rolls of a uh, four up, that uh, reroll is is critical. So I think running the Chosen with the, the Warriors um, and to a degree the Knights as well, but they may not be from a speed point of view um, on par with them, uh, they're a good option. Um, the Spawn, I love. Um, very unpredictable. Uh, I love running them in, in MSU. I ran them a couple of them within the Fate Swarm, which was awesome because they then actually had the minus one rent. So if you're rolling well and they have that ability where they it's um, uh, 2d6 attacks with them, but if you roll the double, um, it's not fours to hit and fours to wound, it's threes to hit and threes to wound. So you roll something good like two fives, you've got ten attacks, threes and threes, minus one rent, that's great. Um, so I, I sort of I like the unpredictability about it. Um, other players who, who want a little bit more certainty with their game, probably not a good choice. Um, but, you know, especially with a lot of the abilities now where they pop up when you kill models um, within certain, I think Zench um, can do that quite a bit in some of uh, their uh, unit choices. 
Uh, they can really wreak havoc on some of the um, the army uh, units that they're with because they, they can stick around. So they don't have a great save, um, but they have, I think it's a five up with five wounds. Um, but um, they can cause a little bit of damage. They can move around. Again, unpredictability with their movement as well because I think that's 2d6 as well or 3d6 on, the, on, on a run. Um, so I don't know. They, they can really be underperformers, but when you need them to, they can really step it up and have a bit of fun with it. Gore Beast haven't used a lot in War Shrine. I'll let Trav talk about that because I know we both use it quite a lot. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the Gore Beast Chariot um, is probably, you know, it's a more killy version of the normal Chariot. Um, I like it. Um, the um, the War Shrine is a big one. Um, I think it's a uh, an important sort of piece in your army because it, it itself, I think, as we sort of alluded to earlier, it doesn't really do a whole much. So the guy on top is kind of here or there in terms of the damage he does, the the beast carrying the chariot underneath. Again, it's sort of a pseudo monster, so it, it suffers from the old force to hit, so half the time it's not really going to do anything. Um, but in terms of what it provides, it's quite important. Um, it's not hugely expensive, um, so it's not like you're paying, you know, two, 300 points for this thing, um, but it provides you a sort of a, a, an ignore wounds bubble, um, so death save bubble that shrinks as it slowly dies. Um, but uh, again, that sort of can catch people out and buff your resilience up. Like if you've got a unit with the shields next to some mystical terrain, for example, all of a sudden you're sitting on a five up, six up, six up against mortal wounds and you, you start to get quite hard to kill. Um, and then the buffs that it can provide to other units as well um, are nice. Um, doesn't always work. So it's not like a pick a unit and away you go. You have to roll dice, three plus for it to work. Um, but the buffs it provides um uh, are quite cool um and then once again depending on what you're looking to get out of your army um if you are looking to build more of an army that looks cool for show because you like that old school um you know uh chaos marauding force you know came out of the chaos waste equivalent to that in the age of sigma version um it's a, a quite a tall quite a large model so it can be a nice centerpiece for your army as well um, which is different from the gaming point of view but um can be can be very cool to look at speaking of centerpiece models and uh i don't know if you guys are expecting me to ask about this uh it's uh one that i wish that forge world would bring back yes um it is an amazing model it is very rare as hen's teeth it is the chaos war mammoth um 22 wounds um, I don't know if it's really worth talking about because it is rare and it's very hard to find. And it's one of those models that um, it's not like you can kit bash it. It's a very, very unique piece. Uh, I'm sure there's some China forge out there somewhere kind of creating it. Um, have you guys ever looked at the chaos uh, war mammoth war scroll? And if you had the option, would you take it? Uh, yeah, I would. Um, I'd go buy one tomorrow. I know I can. Um, I just like having both kidneys where they are. Really, um, it's if you can get a couple of them, but you're looking at a minimum, you know, five, six, seven hundred dollars. Um, and, that's and, how and, rare they are. And the Sherpa to carry it around because it's not yes. fitting in a GW carry case. No, and that's the general thought on a lot of the um, the uh, Slaves of Darkness groups uh, is the basing for it as well and, and the right size, the correct size, because from memory up until recently, I think when GW um, officially came out with the base sizes, um, uh, it was just hit and miss, really. I think the Dreadsorium was similar to that as well, that it just, whatever you wanted, you know, you want to have a dinner plate, put it on that, that's fine. Um, but I think they it, make base sizes big enough for the War Mammoth, really. Yeah. It's massive. Yeah, a lot of uh, MDF work, I think, from a lot of players who are running around with it at the moment. They know what it's meant to be, but you've got to try and make it up yourself, really. Um, there are a few alternatives for obviously non-GW-based events um, that you can have out there that I know a lot of players uh, do use, that you don't have to spend a fortune getting an official one that still look quite good. Uh, so there are options out there. Um, I haven't invested in one. I'd love to. Um, my, my issue is it's still a big uh, cost investment to get one, and I think... With the uh, fluidity of the army at the moment, um, you could go buy one tomorrow, paint it up really nice, and then suddenly the War Mammoth isn't there anymore, really. Um, so unless I felt that there was a level, little bit more certainty that that type of unit would be hanging around um, for the long term, I'm probably not keen to have the investment. But look, if someone wants to come and give me one tomorrow, 
I will run it, especially with sale. Throwing it forward is a, is a great opportunity because it, I think it has been nerfed a little bit over the last year or two in terms of what it can do. Um, but uh, especially with, I think, uh, the, the, I think it had some ability previously about um, when it was wounded, it did a lot of damage to the units around it. So I think it had a lot more benefit in throwing it forward into your, into your opponent's army and just letting it uh, get wounded and wreak further havoc. That's been toned down a bit, but still it's a good beat stick. And when we're talking about an army that doesn't have a lot of damage output, doesn't have any real strong inherent uh, large ran monsters, the War Mammoth fits that that really well. It's just it's not a core unit that you can get your hands on quite readily. Yeah, no, great call. Um, so we've kind of talked about all the units and the and the War Machines or your Behemoths. Um, the last thing you've kind of we've kind of talked about the battalion, and we definitely. Um, have shared some thoughts so you've got three battalions um i know one's really popular one not so much so you've got your fate sworn um champions of ruin um any thoughts around uh, these three particular war i uh, say these particular battalions um so i i personally like the one that lets you fight in the hero phase um, um just because it's nice to be able to play in that space of doing things out of sequence um the, yeah, that, that's probably my, the one I would I would consider running, and I have run before um, and forgot that I could fight in the hero phase every single time. But um, assuming I had remembered, that would have been really cool. I imagine that would, have you, that would be helpful. Yeah. And, Sean, you are a fan of? The Godsworn Warband. That's what I'm running. I like the one that Travis just mentioned as well. Um, this one I've, I just like because it's fun. Um, it... it is just slightly unpredictable, but it, it has its uh, benefits, um, especially in, in messing with your, your opponent in terms of the potential damage output that it, it can produce. And it's very thematic. And like I said, I'm not playing Slaves of Darkness to win any tournaments. Um, I want to get the best out of it. And, and because of that, I want to have a lot of fun with it as much as possible. And I think that particular uh, battalion is very thematic. It sort of um, it fits with the army in terms of absorbing energy into what the war shrine is, and then shooting them out as doom bolts across the um, uh, across the battlefield. But what I love about it is it has that uh, capacity to backfire as well. It sort of has that Skaven feel to it, because what actually happens is if I roll quite well and say I've got uh, ten units and I roll ten dice and roll a, a very high number of sixes, um, let's say I roll eight sixes for sake, and there aren't eight enemy units that I can physically see, then any spare Doom Bolts don't disappear. I have to choose my own units for those Doom Bolts to hit. So there's a little bit of fun in that as well. It's never happened, but, you know, just the potential for it to slightly backfire and uh, have the Doom Bolts redirect and start smacking your own units is, is quite, quite fun to have. Any thoughts or do you see a, a reason to take, say, the God's, God Wrath or the Ruinbringer Warbands? Uh, I'm no. guessing no. I think I no, think, not really. <laughs> it's not good. No. Let's just go nah. No, no. I I think I have seen a few of the players um, who have had some success with those. Um, I think one of them is very. I think it might be the the room bringer that's uh, very uh, tailored towards the uh, mounted units. And I think that has its. If you if you're a very strong slaves to darkness player with your knights with your chariots. Uh, and you can play those well. I think that potential battalion is quite good. Um, but, but other than that, I, I personally haven't um, delved too far into the other ones. Yeah, likewise. I, I think if you did build that fast-mounted army of knights and um, royal horse and chariots and stuff, maybe that one's got a spot. But um, no, otherwise, I, I think you're probably down to the two we've already talked about. Yeah, that's fair. Um Slaves to Darkness has um, a really strong ally pool, and you've got uh, Bray Herds, Chaos Gargans, Ever Chosen, Corn, Monsters of Chaos, Nurgle, Slanish, Zench, and War Herds. Uh, it's almost like the question of who don't you ally with. Um, now, without going into every single ally and and talking about the different benefits, I guess the two questions I have would be one. Um, is there any gaps that you see your allies really plugging? Uh, and if so, uh, what are some of the standout choices across all of your allies? Or do you, or is it not worth taking allies? That's that's another part of it, right? Um, 
Uh, personally, I, I like the idea of allying in some of the characters that can buff your stuff, even though that's not their normal army. Um, so, for example, you've got um, so uh, in corn you can take uh, um, the the banner, the um, the blood secreted banner. It buffs corn mortal units, so any corn marked unit will get um, the benefits of it. Um, you've got the Nurgle, which I think Sean mentioned before. Um, you know, any again any mortal Nurgle unit um, buff sort of thing. Um, it, it all, it, it works. It doesn't stop working because they're an ally all of a sudden or anything like that. Um, so I, I like the idea of bringing those in. Um, I haven't actually, beyond that, I haven't actually spent that much time looking at what units and stuff I might actually include, but that's more just because of how I built my army. It was based on the units representing certain things and stuff that sat outside of that didn't really have a place. Um, yeah, but yeah, that's fair. And Sean, where where are you at with allies? Yeah, no, I definitely uh, taking Travis's point, uh, focusing on a lot of the the Zench and the the Corn and the Nurgle mortal units uh, that do retain that buff capacity within a Slaves of Darkness army, um, or plug certain holes. Like from a Zench point of view. Uh, something like maybe the Gaunt Summoner to give you that that horde because there's nothing that you've got, especially if you have an MSU style army for slaves, to really beat back, um, you know, 20 plague bear bearers or something like that, or, or those big horde units uh, um, that could uh, really just swarm your army. Um, for me, like I said, I'm very much sitting with Nurgle at the moment, so uh, stand out for me is a Harbringer. Um, the knights and warriors are, like we said, resilient. We've spoken about that. You give them an extra five up as well, especially you know on the mortal wounds with a five up, five up, six up. They're not going anywhere, um, and then they retain the buffs because they're, they're Nurgle. Uh, it's Nurgle. It's mortal. It gets it. Um, I've started having a go with Blowab as well from a Nurgle point of view, and they buff each other because he's got the mortal keyword as well, so he benefits from the War Shrine that's already in the piece, in, in your army. You know, it gives you an extra um, uh, summoning opportunity as well as some slight shooting, <laughs> be it uh, 14 inches, and um, gives that debuff in terms of minus one to hit to make them hang around that little bit longer if you need them to. So units like that, um, I think, and people are probably listening who have had a huge uh, level of... Um, Variants on that who've tried other things because, like you said, there's a multitude of different opportunities with all the different factions. I'm sure there is a lot of different uh, opportunities out there. And that's the other, going back to why you play this type of army, you're not sitting there with the same, you know, uh, 10 to 12 units with a very minimum ally pool. You've got a lot of opportunities. So although, you know, you might feel you're quite successful with the army, I know for a fact there's a number of other things that I haven't even looked at yet. And just looking through some of the war scrolls for the, either the Corn, Zench, Slanesh, um, or, or Nurgle mortals and thinking, oh, if I, if I twisted it a bit and, and use this mark, how would that impact it? Um, it? It's got a lot of life and it's got a lot of opportunities that, you know, that's why there's long, a lot of longevity within the Slaves to Darkness army because you can try a lot of different things. Um uh, one thing that I math hammering here, I'm clearly not a Slaves of Darkness player. Um, I do have a lot of 5th edition um, Chaos Warriors. Um, but math hammering this, you know, if I was thinking about building a Slaves of Darkness army, I might consider a Bloodthirster to have that kind of combat punch. Uh, I imagine Travis is like, oh, no, yeah. not really. No? Uh, like, a, like a Bloodthirster of Incessant Rage or something or like, you know, like it's two, two, two 300 kind of beat stick. Um, no? Um, yeah, you could. You certainly can. Um, uh, the problem with something like that, and I think it comes back to the classic monster problem, is um, they, they can be quite swingy. Um, usually it's rare that you find something that just functions on its own. So your blood thirst, for example, functions quite well. Um, when it's in a corn army because you can usually use a prayer or something like that to give it a reroll of some kind or command ability to give it something. You're not going to get any of that. So you are relying on that thing to stand on its own. Um, sure, it might work. Um, yeah, you might go in and get all, you know, all hit, all wound, and all of a sudden I've done just as much damage as I did when I was playing in the corn army. 
but you can also, oh, I've missed a hit, I've missed a wound, and all of a sudden I've only done one hit. And realistically, something like a bloodthirster actually isn't that hard to kill. Um, um, people go, oh, it's a bloodthirster, but, you know, if they're, they're 14 wounds or 12 wounds, 14 wounds with a four-up save, it's not like it's going to be indestructible. Um, and once you start knocking it down a couple of pegs on its chart, it, it fades pretty quick. So I think you're relying on something like that. You're relying too much on, to, on it to stand on its own two feet because it's not going to get any benefits from being in your army. It might get some coincidental ones. I should probably wouldn't. I can't think of anything it would get from being in a slave to darkness army. No, I, I'm imagining plugging a gap here. So like conscious yeah. of, you know, I'm thinking of gaps, right? So I'm thinking like something like a bloodthirster could be good to plug a gap. And, and um, you know, people traditionally will look at a bloodthirster and put a lot of focus on it. And maybe that detracts from the rest of your army being attacked. Um, I can imagine something like Skyfires being a nice little support unit if you had a, a Chaos Knight army. Um, I'm imagining something like, uh, I'm a big fan of like monsters. So the fact that you guys ally with Chaos Monsters, something like some Cockatrice, which is 100 points, uh, has a pretty decent shooting attack, um, could could kind of plug that gap. Um, I guess the, the, the point of this is that you have a very deep ally pool, maybe one of the deepest outside of Stormcast. And um, I think there's a lot of cool things you can do to play, whether it's for hobby or for competitiveness. Yeah, definitely. You've definitely got a huge range to pick from. Um, uh, I, I certainly haven't explored the full range. I'm sure you could sit there and spend a week reading through all the different possibilities. Um, there is probably some really cool stuff out there that you could ally in. Um, just looking at the chat, someone said the um, the contorted epit epitome, so the new um, Slanesh um, thing. The, the half lady? Yeah. No, not that one. The, um, the weird messes with magic one. Oh, cool. yeah mirror mechanical mirror looking thing um so yeah so there's certainly um lots of different things out there um that you could probably find a use for yeah cool i think we've talked about all the units so is that have I, or i missed something uh no i think you've got them all yeah awesome all. all right well let's talk about customizing that list so uh what's really cool is you have a, a series of command traits and you have artifacts so are there any what 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 out of the six command traits stand out for for you uh sean is there what one stand out for you and where do you where do you use some of these uh for me i generally stick with the same one uh which is the um uh, Master of Deception, uh, which I put on the which I put on the, the Lord of Manticore, because I will generally get him up in combat to at least do a little bit of damage. So, is, so that's it, minus one to hit. Minus uh, one to hit. Yeah. So it, it makes him that little bit more resilient uh, in some of the attacks, especially if there's another monster or, or large hero piece going into him as well um, to give it a little bit more resilience uh, and to hang around a little bit longer. Um, if I was going to try and um, make him a little bit more uh, beat stick, uh, the, the Flames of Spite is another interesting one, which is the unmodified wound rolls of any attacks made by the general as a six. The target suffers one mortal wound in addition to normal damage. Uh, that would be my go-to if I wanted him to be a little bit more, um, uh, yeah, a little bit more damaging. Uh, but that, they'd be the two that I'd focus on. Trav, yourself? Um, so I've always run, so this actually changed in... Um, in the newest general's handbook, a slight nerf, which is a bit annoying, but um, I always had Lord of Terror, um, and I combine that with jumping ahead to the artifacts of power. So I combine that with the Helm of the Oppressor, which basically, so currently it's it's minus, so they're both minus one, but the Helm of the Oppressor used to be minus two. two. Um, so you've all of a sudden got this minus three bravery bubble around your Lord. Um, if the Knights happen to be there as well, it's minus four, and that has certainly. Um, caught a lot of people out, um, particularly against some of those other armies that aren't necessarily great with bravery um, and rely on elite stuff. So Stormcast, um, Iron Jaws, um, things like that. So I've, I've had a unit of brutes. I, I get the sneak. I do four wounds and kill one brute, but then the whole unit runs away because they're minus four bravery and they're only bravery six anyway. So um you, you that that's that was what I always used to to head towards I guess which wasn't so much about making the the Lord himself any better but it was about making everyone else a little bit worse um, so that that's that's what I that was kind of my go-to for it so now that the artifacts change do you still stick with that artifact or is there another oh, artifact that stands out for you I, I might change it up a little bit 
um, I, I would consider changing it up um, slightly um, to, to uh, actually, I probably wouldn't. Actually, I'd probably stick with it. It's a well, good guess- choice. It's a good choice because, like I said, you, you don't have a huge amount of damage output, so you may only kill – you're not going to kill the whole unit. You're going to kill one or two models. So that potential for a, a bravery debuff uh, through stacking those options is a great option for Slaves of Darkness. Yeah. yeah and you can still get a ne- another neg one from uh, one of the Forbidden Power spells as well. So you can get that bravery bomb uh, happening if, if you want to go down that route. Yep. Sean, yourself? Uh, what, moving into the artifacts? Yeah, or? artifacts. And, and I guess, you know, uh, one, we've got artifacts. You've got six artifacts inherent with Slaves of Darkness. Yep. But then we've also obviously got Malign Sorcery. So um, I, I guess the first one is, do we like the artifacts that are slaves or are we pulling from Malign Sorcery? Yeah, um, generally no. I think uh, since uh, the 2018 General's Handbook where they added in the Mark of All Favours um, to replace one of the other ones uh, with the whole change in command abilities uh, has been a nice addition. I know there was a lot of discussion early on about how the wording was for that and how to use it effectively. Um, I, I generally use that. I'll put it on the Demon Prince and it makes him a little, little bit more um, resilient because I gives him every mark, um, which gives him the reroll ones across the board. Uh, in terms of... Uh, anything else, I will generally move away. The other artifact I mainly use is a rune shield minus three ren from Malign Sorcery. Put that on the uh, Lord of Manticore because that will turn him into a bit of a tank with his sword because previously it's four attacks, threes and threes, uh, I believe no rend and D3 damage. So mm-hmm. there's a fantastic opportunity to give him a, a minus three rend in that, which is exactly the right artifact, I feel, for that model. Because, again, with the buffs there, that's, you know, threes, threes re-rolling ones, minus three rend, D3 damage uh, on that sword. And uh, you add it with the other attacks from the manticore, the tail and the claws. You can actually, I find I'm, I'm pulling out a bit of damage now when before you're lucky to put four or five wounds on anything with that, that type of model. Trav, any malign sorcery artifacts you like for your army? Um, I actually haven't. I haven't really looked at them too much. Um, so not in not in general, but in relation to the Slaves of Darkness army. Um, uh, they, look, they, they, there's certainly something I could find. I'm sure um, it's more of a sort of a you know, nice little utility thing, something like that. Um, the sword to up your end there. Um, uh, the, there's certainly going to be something there. Um, but I. I Every time I've run them, I've stuck with my bravery debuff combination, um, uh, just because what it is, it, it worked quite well. Um, combination with the knights and stuff as well. But um, with the change to that magic item, yeah, I might revisit that. Um, have a look and see if I can find something nifty in there that'll that'll fill a slightly different role um, rather than the ones that I'm already looking at. So yeah, for sure. And I'm sure we can leverage some of the most common ones like Thermal Rider Cloak, Sword of Judgment, like yeah, so many Griff Feather Charm. I'm sure those generic ones that are popular would easily slot into this faction as well. Um, probably a quick shout out to the chat who are calling out the uh, the Epitome, um, who is just a great uh, model to, to ally into this faction. So I know we talked about it. I just want to reinforce it because it seems like the chat is saying, yep, yeah, yeah. multiple unbinds there's some you know some bene- lots of benefits that this brings to the table so um shout out to to tam the third who's um put out a lot of detail into that response um endless spells are we including endless spells which ones do we like um which ones add the most bang for buck or no not really unless you've got like the sorcerer lord on manticore um sean you're a big spell casting kind of magic person um where are you at with endless spells uh it used to be unfortunately with the battalion i've got it doesn't leave uh, a lot of room for um additional when you've gone through the core requirements for the battalion added a few additional buff pieces like the harbinger and a few others and i've got 20 to 40 points left over at the end um i have dabbled with shackles but unfortunately with only one key spellcaster in the list i've got at the moment being sale and being you know primarily used for his inherent spell um it's been very limiting uh, to do so. Um, I have swapped out the shackles, which just weren't a good opportunity to use um, previously and put the um, 
uh, Palisade in, which I have found to be a better option because especially when I'm coming across some of the shooty armies, that uh, just to throw in front of some of the, the smaller pieces uh, that are going to get hit hard, be it, say, the Demon Prince or Sail or a few others that are really need that late game to do something different um, or, or, or to, to get some models up the other end has been a really good opportunity against those shooting armies. Um, but generally, in what I'm running at the moment, no. Um, I don't have the points with what I've got, and I really don't have the spellcasters available um, with what I'm running to be able to do that effectively. Yeah. And Trev, where are you at with endless spells? Um, so I've always had um, just the cogs sitting in the list just because I was really trying to make sure I get to combat um, and trying to catch people out with really long charges. Um, but, yeah, Sean's right. You don't, you don't have... Um, so the Sorcerer Lord's cool and all, um, but you don't have that equivalent wizard that some other armies get where it's like, you know, I can cast twice a turn and I'm plus two and this sort of stuff. You don't have someone like that. So um, you're not going to get a hugely powerful magic phase out of them. Um, hero phase, sorry. Um, but um, I, I think there's maybe a spot for some of the smaller ones, but I wouldn't be trying to put in any of the huge ones that um, chew, A, chew up a lot of points and B, um, are quite difficult to cast, um, uh, relatively difficult in terms of endless spells, that is, but um, I probably wouldn't be putting any of them in. So, yeah, the other point too is, uh, you know, there are no two level two, they call whatever you want to call it, uh, spell casters where you have that secondary option. And the, the casters that you do have, um, their inherent spells are really the focus. You've got Sail for the movement. Uh, you've got the Winds of, of Chaos for the, the Lord on, on Manticore, which, you know, can be quite devastating if you do it well. Or you've got the Demonic Power out of the Sorcerer on foot. Um, again, all, um, you know, one casters and um, you're using them for them. So y you don't really have a lot of opportunity to throw out that spare um, endless spell that you have available or even to unbind one, really. So it is very limiting without obviously moving into some of your ally pools, which I'm sure there are opportunities there. Yeah, and I was just going to call out, if, if, if you're finding you're in a, a very mag magic-heavy meta or you're trying to build a list with magic and, you know, your inherent casters aren't strong enough, maybe there's a reason to ally that Lord of Change in, um, you know, who's going to get those spells off. And maybe Cogs, I think, is a really good shout. Or as you guys were mentioning earlier, which is um, your Uber driver or your bridge um, could be a nice way to move your, your people up the board um, or sail. So, um could be an option um there are some there are some other things um i mean your geminids obviously are always strong i think your standard your standard choices come into play um i think shackles is a great call out especially from the sorcerer lord or manticore who's throwing around blow it throwing up a wall and then moving along that's a lot we've gone through a lot um and I guess, you know, like now that we're kind of getting a really good understanding of list building and uh, some of the, the stronger unit choices and hero choices and how to formulate this list, I guess. Uh, and obviously there's no one single bullet when it comes to building this faction. I think uh, if you're a, a hobbyist at heart, you know, there's a lot of cool toys you can play with. If you are a competitive player, you're probably not playing Slade's jokes, um, but you definitely are thinking about um, how to optimize your list better. And I think thinking about, you know, if I'm going to have like a, a Chaos Knight unit, I really want to start buffing that up when we've talked about the the the, the Demonic Lord. Um, so we've got a lot of synergy happening in this faction. I think, Travis, you've called out really well. Um if we're going to ally people in, we're going to bring in that synergy buffs as opposed to something that doesn't work out of the faction. Mm. So the last couple of questions I want to ask before we kind of start wrapping this up is really around how do I get the best out of Slaves to Darkness on the table? Like what are the tactics? What are the advice you give a new player? You know, you know what's from all the experience in the games that you've had, both positive and negative, how do I get the most out of this faction? Sean, I'll throw it to you first. Yeah, okay. So you're not going to go in there and wreak havoc. You're not going to go out there and kill a lot of your opponent's army. That's a given. Now, I know it's a bit throwaway with people saying, we'll just ally in something big, but I think Travis was right on the mark that you can, but that at best it puts you on par with your opponent and it, it still doesn't provide you certain synergies those larger pieces get from within their faction through artifacts or spells or other bonuses. So it may 
plug a hole, but it doesn't win you the game. It won't get you over the line. It'll just make you more competitive. Um, so I will never go into a game expecting to kill my opponent's army. And honestly, I didn't really start winning games until I changed my mindset and thought it's about objectives. And we all know about that now. It's really focusing on the objectives and how can I ensure that I can maneuver myself to be able to do that. And I'll go back to the point I said before, playing an objective game with slaves, thinking of my models as more resilient skinks and using the MSU of what I've got, which is 10 units to five warriors and a lot of support buff pieces around them where I know they're going to hang around. I'll throw a unit of five into or line them up to, to stop a charge, lose one or two, then move them away towards an unguarded objective or retreat them out of combat and move them somewhere else. Um, that's how I've found I've started winning games. I haven't tried to kill. And I think out of every game I've won, I have had little to no models left um, where my opponent has had 50% plus of their army left on the board. So that gives you a bit of an idea of the sort of the tactics um, that I've gone to with um, playing the game. And it wasn't until I changed my mindset where I think I've got to kill my opponent's army. Um, I've, you know, I've got to try and be the fastest. Um, that's not going to happen. It's just about using lots of small units, moving them around. Because honestly, I can't say that the way I play my army in that regard, there are a lot of armies um, that do something similar uh, in terms of like there's no horde, there's no fast movement, they're resilient, and I can move them around the board in that regard. And that's sort of how I feel as though, for me personally, um, I've managed to turn the tide of my own gameplay and not just become a competitive player, um, which some could say is quite hard with uh, pure slaves of darkness. But like I said, I've, I'm winning 50% of my games, which is great um, because I'm just taking something different. And that was the mentality I went into CanCon. I, I had, I think I ran, I won three games and I was very close to winning a fourth. My expectation was if I ran one, one, one game, I'd be disappointed. If I won two, that was great. Anything more than that was a bonus. And I hit that uh, outcome that I wanted. But more than that, I wanted to, to set my, my army up on the board and look at my opponent and then say, geez, I haven't had to deal with something like this before. What am I going to do? And um, that's what caught a lot of people off. And that, for me, was what won a lot of games because they hadn't seen that style of army before um, because I'm not trying to be the, the toughest. I'm not trying to kill everything. I'm not just trying to be you know, full, full Nurgle where I'm just going to hold you up and not let you move. Um, so by doing that, I think that's, that's the mentality I've gone into and, and to a degree it's been quite successful. I feel like slaves is that, uh, jack of all trades, almost master of none, you know, yeah. like they, they're resilient, but if you want better resilient, you'd be Nurgle. Uh, if you wanted to be a tacky, yeah, they can do some damage, but you know, you're not blades of corn. So, uh, I think that, that that's a really nice touch that you're able to respond appropriately. Your opponent's not going to know a lot of your tricks, if any, um, there just is not enough slaves to darkness in the meta, um, which is a good thing. It means it's, it's, it's really, um, yours to exploit, but I also find that, you know, you're probably never going to have a bad game against the slaves to darkness opponent. So it's always Sean, I've played you a number of times. It's always a good game, win, lose or draw. We have a lot of fun and there's not a lot of, um, I gotcha moments where a surprise comes up and I feel really bad about playing. So, um, probably a really good shout. Um, and the fact that you've gone three, almost four, um, victories at Australia's largest event, CanCon, uh, is a testament. So, um, it can be done. Travis, what about your thoughts? What, what, are, what are some of the best advice that you could provide around using Slaves to Darkness on the table? Um, so my, my actual experience with using them has been driven by um, the, the story choice I made behind my army. So I, I haven't had the opportunity to play with a lot of the stuff um, that you would necessarily, like the full range of, of what you would be able to get in the, in, in the army. Um, I've found that um, the the successes that I've had with my army, the way it's built and the way it needs to work as a result, um, has come from um, being prepared to throw a portion of my army away, but hopefully get something like to hope, but but to get something out of it before it dies. Um, so usually for me, that would either be my knights or my chosen or something like that, or both sometimes. Um, like the knights would commonly go across the board, um, kill a unit or two just because they, they do do an all right amount of damage on the charge with some buffs here and there. 
um, but then they just become a bit of a tar pit. They take a couple of turns for the enemy army to chew through just because they're quite resilient, got a lot of wounds, decent save, they ignore more of the wounds. Um, but I did that in my head going, the knights aren't going to survive. So you have to actually, uh, the successes I've had come from being prepared to essentially throw half your army away but then play for the objectives with the other half um, is, is how I found it. it's worked best. Um, typically, I, I, I'm sitting around, you know, at a standard sort of five-game event, um, either two and three or three and two, so sort of halfway in the middle kind of thing. And, and I'm happy with that. Um, you know, it's not a super competitive army. I'm not expecting to go in there and flesh it a course my way through the enemy army and, uh, and, and you know, just attack 17 times in one turn and go, oh, you're all dead. What a shame. Um, it does, doesn't work that way, that's, that, and that's fine. Um, uh, and as I said, I built my army specifically for a story rather than competitive play so i'm sure if i tweaked it and abandoned some of those elements and, and put some of the units in i should probably have in there um i would do better but um you know that sort of middle of the pack is where i like to sit so that's fine no and that's and that's great i think um it it really is an army that you um the the fight is uphill but every victory is sweeter than you know, yeah, I can I can push 120 witch elves at you and you know uh, buff them up with a hag queen. But uh, am I the tactical genius? And do I get like a uh, you know, is that a hard fought win? Probably not. But every win with with something like a slaves to darkness uh, means so much. And uh, again, a good time. Um, if I was a new player um, and I was thinking about getting into um, Slaves to Darkness for some reason, whether it's I'm drawn to the Chaos Warrior aesthetic, I like this idea of being unaligned or the narrative of fighting for the, the favour of the Chaos Gods, um, what advice would you give me as a new player uh, jumping into Slaves to Darkness? Um, I think you need to think before you... I mean, you can certainly build a core of... Of, of your army with some pretty generic -y stuff um, in terms of like, you know, you, you're probably a safe bet with some warriors and stuff like that. But I think you need to think of really, you need probably do a bit of research and have a think about how you want your army to play. Um, you know, Sean's obviously got a very specific style he uses with um, you know, his multiple small units and a Nurgle army and stuff like that. I've got something quite different. Um, there's definitely a, a fast cavalry chariot type build in there that would be different again. Um, so you probably need to have a bit of a think about what, how you want the army to behave and what you want to get out of it before you move beyond that sort of generic core of your army. Um, but you, there's certainly some stuff that will, will appear no matter what you do. So you probably just start there, I guess, um, and go from there. But definitely have a plan in mind about what how you want the army to play. It, it has options. Um, um, they're, not, they're not all you know hugely hugely different it's not like you're going to turn it into a shooting army anytime soon or anything like that um but you know you do have possibilities that you can work towards love it and sean yourself what, what advice would you give me as a new player yeah look i think the starter box that you can get is is a good is a good point because it's got a lot of the, the standard units in there you got your knights you got your your um warriors you got your shrine you got your manticore they're some of your core units but just like travis said um, it's not a one trick pony. There are so many different ways you can play um, it's just off the bat. And then obviously you expand out and get used to it. Um, you can then see how do I want to play? And then you focus your, your buff pieces around it. Firstly, within faction uh, with certain models. Um, and then you, you move to the next level. What is it that I can ally, ally in? Because that's one of the big benefits of a Slaves of Darkness is the, the different opportunities you've got side outside of faction within your ally pool that you can then draw from. So it's very much stage driven. But if you try and go into it, planning the whole thing out, not knowing how you enjoy playing the army, it's not going to work. So something like the starter box where you've got, you know, the, the variety, even outside of that with Marauders and maybe a Horde style, that's another way you could do it as well. But just a get out there, small games, 500,000 uh, point games with the models, you, you know, you've got, um, trying them, different combinations, and then you'll get used pretty quick to which ones you like running with best. And then you can say, well, how do I make these better, either on defensively or offensively? Um, and then, you know, look in the options you've got in faction and the outside of faction. So the, the advice, again, not being a, a Slaves to Darkness, but I think this is relevant to a lot of people, um, especially maybe for Slaves to Darkness, is my advice to you would be to find a potentially a, um, a neutral colour scheme. Um, 
especially, you know, like I can only imagine like, you know, I buy a unit of Chaos Warriors and I paint them up red because I love the, the idea of corn. But then I find out they don't act like I want or maybe I want to kind of start synergizing and start working with them um, with other factions. So all of a sudden I've got this unit of Chaos Warriors I, know I, I need to repaint or uh, might be confusing to my opponent because they are really zench, but I painted them up as corn. Um, I liked when um, Doug 2 Plus Tough was painting up his Slaves to Darkness and he used a black and gold or a black and silver color scheme to keep it neutral um, away from the Chaos God. And obviously that allows you to play across all five. Um, does that mean that, you know, if you paint them red, will your opponent stop you from making them zench? Probably not. Um, but I, I, I imagine that would be good advice. Sean, I, I can see you're like nodding and like. No, I actually just completely disagree with you. It's very ineffective. You do what I do and buy like 150 warrior, um, knights or warriors and you just paint 30 of them in, in each color. That's, that's a lot more, lot more enjoyable. All right. Well, Sean's the expert, clearly. So ignore me. Uh, don't 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 listen to my practical advice of painting them a neutral color. Uh, do what Sean does and go all in on Slaves yeah. to Darkness and uh, buy uh, two hundred Chaos Warriors because yep. uh, they are the bee's knees. That's right. Um, is there any other advice that either of you or insights or, uh, or, or top tips that you want to share that we haven't covered just yet? Ah, <sighs> no, very comprehensive. Yeah. Um, I, the only thing is I'd be very interested to see, um, how it, uh, the future plans out with any integration with, um, uh, ever chosen as well. Like we talked, we've spoken a little bit about the align towards um, Dark Oath in terms of the Marauder style, but going to the other end, you know, what are the opportunities and synergies that, that potentially may come about with any alignment to, to ever chose? And, and then, you know, you've got some more beat stick opportunities um, to synergize with. So that's something that we don't know about yet, but uh, has the potential to be a factor moving forward. Yeah, look, look I, I can, you know, there, there are big rumors going around, and we can only assume that Warcry is just the start of this, um, this merging or combining of uh, the chaos undivided or unaligned um, uh, models. And if there is a way to bring the, you know, Archeon and his Varen Guard from the Ever Chosen, if there is a way to kind of really flesh out this Marauder or this Barbarian style uh, Dark Oath. Um, maybe add an extra couple of models to slaves and bring that under one umbrella. Um, I think you and uh, I think it's fair to say Travis and and Sean uh, will probably do another version of this. Um, but I think it's an exciting time that um, there is an allegiance ability. You've got lots of cool models to touch into. You can tap into your ally pool. Uh, this is a nice flexible army that you can do a lot with. Yeah, for sure. Great. If people want to find you, I feel like I've tapped the well and there is nothing left when it comes to all the knowledge because you've given it to everyone over the last two hours. Um, if people want to chat to you and ask for advice, Sean, I know you're on Twitter, but more importantly, you have spoken a lot about, uh, there's a, is there a, a Slaves to Darkness Facebook group or a WhatsApp group? Like where can I learn more about Slaves to Darkness and yourself? Yeah, no, you're right. I do have Twitter. Um, I'm not that big on it, unfortunately, but uh Yes, there is a core. I think it's uh, Ever Chosen and Slaves. I'll, I'll quickly pull it out, see if I can make sure I get it right. Um, there is a particular group in there that um, a, a lot of the players from around the world who, who, who really, uh, Ever Chosen and Slaves is the name of the group. And um, that is a fantastic group. Um, there's a lot of uh, Australian players in it um, from, a, from around, um, uh, I think, Melbourne and Adelaide. There's a few down there as well. And some really hardcore slave players from overseas, the, the UK and the US as well. So if you are a new player wanting to get into it, um, there are a lot of new players in there asking for general startup advice. Um, but then it goes right through to um, list submissions, uh, list feedback, tournaments coming up and uh, everyone is very supportive and proactive in that group to provide feedback in terms of additional model choices spell choices artifact choices to help get the best out of your army so i'm quite active in that group the sydney group as well um so they're, they're the key areas that you'd get me most on more so than twitter perfect and uh travis we can listen to you on the heralds below no 
Uh, um, sorry, just um, continue a joke from the start. <laughs> Travis, where can people find you to learn more and chat with you? Uh, so mostly on Twitter. Um, so I'm at... Uh, Thonius? Thonius83, yep. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I do have a, a Facebook account that um, travels, uh, travels, Travis Heralds Cooper, but I, I admit I, I struggle to keep up with it um, mostly because trying to switch between two is really Heralds of War, you're just an absolute celebrity. Australia's uh, best podcast, uh, one of the biggest uh, OG first podcast for Age of Sigma in Australia, Clint yep. and the crew that you are a part of uh, is incredible. Uh, download that and subscribe 100%. Um, but you are Thonius83? Yeah, that's me. Yep. Uh, both, by the way, you can find that in the channel description. Sean, sorry, your Twitter's still in there right now, so I either have to delete it or uh, would you, you're, you're about to really join Twitter and um, yeah. make, make the most of it. Let's force Sean to use it. Yes, no, please do. Happy to use it. Uh Cool. And, and finally, you clearly know where, where to find me. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure to subscribe. I recently created a Facebook group, final, well, not Facebook group, Facebook, Facebook page. Create a Facebook page. Finally, 18 months of being a content creator, uh, being an influencer. No, not really. Uh, influence nothing. Guys, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, join the AOS Coach uh, Facebook page if you haven't already done so. Sean, Travis, you guys have been absolute gems. You've shared so much knowledge when it comes to Slaves to Darkness. Uh, very cool faction, underrated faction. I think um, people can take your advice and and uh, really make the most out of their hobby experience and build out this faction because it is good. And I think you'll be a, a, in front of the meta when this eventual new book comes. Not that I know anything, but uh, the rumors are very strong. Yes, there are a few. Just a few, but uh, all right, well, let's end this. All right. Bye. <laughs> that was an awkward end. See you guys. See ya. Bye.